Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, if you can tell me, I mean, reason behind this, because what happens is your voice will echo if you connect from two devices. Okay, uh, the reason is just in case, uh, see this uh, intermittent connectivity, if there is any problem, hmm. so that's why I've kept that as a standby. Do I put that off? Uh, yes, you can do that. Um, what that, is, that, is, that is in another room only. Okay, then, then it is okay. Not a problem. Uh, because I've got two routers in different rooms. Okay, not a problem. Different Wi-Fi. So just in case if there is any connectivity problem, then I can switch. Okay, okay. Not a problem, sir. Ah, then, it's not the same. But uh, that device also then, sir, you will have to connect to the audio because in case if this current laptop uh, are not able to use and when you go to the other device, it is not connected to audio. So if you talk, it will not be audible. Okay. So now I'll just go there and make sure that that is connected to the audio and then I'll leave it as it is and come to this room. Is sure, it okay? sure. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so we aren't able to hear you. Can you hear me? I I cannot hear you. So maybe you could try without uh, the earphones. And uh, remove the connection also. Yeah. Can, can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes. Now I can. Yes. Okay. I'll... I can hear you. So, so what I will do is in the meanwhile, I will uh, stop the video of your other laptop huh. so that in uh, we can, at least now it is connected. So we can mute and unmute later in case if you have. So this thing and I have my uh, mobile also ready with me in case I need to go on to the mobile and do it also. Okay, then okay, so not a problem. Okay. All right, sir. The echo will happen only if the audio is on, no? Yes, sir, that's right. Uh, 
Uh, so, so for, if you are connecting from the cell phone, uh, you need not connect to audio. Yeah, I'm not connecting to audio. Yes. So it's just as a standby there. Yes, yes, not a problem. Uh, Dr. Rai, can you hear me? Hello, uh, Dr. Kyagi. Hi. Um, so, would you like to uh, share your screen and uh, kind of check your presentation that all yeah. the slides are working fine? Yeah, sure. Just give me a second. Uh, so, any videos in your presentation? No. Okay.
Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, I can see. Uh, so if you can go uh, uh, ahead a little, maybe a couple of slides. So we will know. Yeah, okay, okay, all right. So I'll just run through it just to make sure that it works. So there was a little bit of a hitch there, wasn't it? Okay, that's me. That's good. Sure. Uh, you could you stop uh, sharing now, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Good. So uh, there's nothing else I need to do just now, isn't it? No, nothing's all right now. Great. We have Thank another 15, 17 minutes. All right. All right. All right. Great. So I'll pop back in about. Hello, good evening. Good evening, sir. We can hear you now. Okay, okay. Back. Right. Thank you. Very scared that if the link doesn't work, you are really. Good evening, Ravishankar sir. Good evening. Thomas, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Bangalore is in lockdown. Yeah, lockdown. We are in the crisis. In it. How is the Mumbai cases now? Mumbai is uh, still bad, but uh, not uh, peaking. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. We are just peaking. Yeah. So Mumbai is a little better than earlier. Yeah, yeah. You are all practicing, sir? Not as yet. Waiting for another month or so to go, then we'll start. Okay, okay, okay. Online, online consults. Online consults are going on. Okay, nice, sir. Nice. Yeah. You are having COVID cases in your hospital. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Enough COVID. Around 300 COVID cases, I think. Oh, my God. Yeah. So now you should write a paper on neurology of COVID. Yeah, already uh, preliminary things have gone, actually. A stroke and other things, whatever uh, cases uh, preliminary, we are just collected the case series and all going on. But it's a tough time because our consultants are posted in the COVID wards and all along with the medicine. Oh. Take care. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tricky disease. Oh, yeah, tricky, sir. Doctor Debashis has not joined, sir. Uh, he's, I think, still to join. Yeah. So we look forward to your case. Always. Yes, sir. Interesting, interesting. You yes, can. Uh... <laughs> Always interesting. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good, good. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, sir Chitra. Hi, sir. Hi, Sujarita. How are you, sir? Hi, Dr. Thomas. How are you, sir? Fine, fine. Doing well. You are Suchitra or Sucharita? Sir, I am Sucharita. Sucharita. Yeah. Name is showing a Suchitra. You guys will be able to finish within 10 minutes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. That we have two minutes for some interaction. Yes, sir. Manasi, the uh, interaction will also be by the chat box, or it's going to be uh, unmuting the uh, person who is asking the question. 
So how do you want to take it? Uh, we can do it uh, either ways. Uh, will we have enough time to unmute and then uh, take the question and then? Uh... <laughs> Keep it last, sir. Keep it last. Because otherwise, each case they are going to discuss, then it will never end. Uh, last means uh, after all the six cases? Or you just give two questions. You take uh, two important questions or something uh, like that, you limit. I think, uh, Mansi, if it comes through the chat box, mm -hmm. because see, by the time, uh, say, Thomas starts and he finishes the last slide, and that is when the uh, dilemma will start, there won't be enough time for them to type out questions and send it across. So we'll take two questions, give them the unmute the mic. Okay. And, uh, now the question is, which two in what order you will never come to know, no? Or you'll yes. know... Uh, no, sir, we will not because what happens is they only raise their hand and we allow them so we unmute their mic basically so they may ask any question they want so part of housekeeping shall i say that we'll take only two questions per case yes so you can do that but uh, still we no. will not be able to guarantee whether those will be really important uh, from a clinical point of view whether they will be relevant and important questions so then let it come through the chat box. What is your experience? So better to come, uh, better that it comes through the chat box because then you can choose which is the question you want to discuss. Okay, fine. So then let it come through the chat box. I will say that they'll have to write the question because uh, see now uh, the mystery to any of these cases will come up in the last two slides. Okay. So by the time they should have type, uh, time to type the chat box and send it across. So, will you explain the method uh, after I finish? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Ah, so, just tell them that you should be ready with your questions and we are not going to be taking uh, this thing. That part I'll tell them. And uh, it's going to be through the chat box. So, they'll have to type and then Devashish and myself will select whichever and uh, ask those questions. Yes, yes, not a problem. Sir, you can uh, see the timing also because 10-10 uh, ten, ten minutes, some six cases are lined up. If the discussion becomes heated up, then it may not finish in time. So we can, uh, maybe two questions you can ask and we, at the end of the talks, I think if people are willing to stay, we can answer the questions uh, one to one. Yes, I think that's uh, what we'll do. We'll take two per uh, presenter and yeah. then end uh, additional uh, discussions if they want to have uh, because all the speakers are going to stay on yes sir so we will take the questions at the end if required so at the moment we'll take two only Okay, I'll come back and uh, join you all. We still have how much time, Mansi? 10 minutes? Uh, yes, about 12 minutes. Okay, so we have to wait for Devashish to join in and other speakers also. Yes, yes, okay, sir. See you back, Thomas. Okay, sir, okay, sir.
Hello, Babesh. Hello, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Right. Good. Babesh, sir, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Thomas. Yes, How sir. Yes, sir. How is Bangalore Good doing? evening, sir. Good Bangalore evening. is bad. Bangalore is bad. Cases are peaking up. Right. We are all in uh, like a war zone only, war zone. War zone. Mumbai is equally bad, Dr. Ravi Shankar? Mumbai is a little better than what it was earlier, but uh, bed position is equally bad. So till that eases off, it's going to be bad. Okay. So I, I see here uh, Alok has also joined in. Alok? Are you Alok, there? Alok, check this uh, video Hi. audio. Right. It's fine. It's fine. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, Sujaita. How are you? How is Chandigarh? Fine, sir. Chandigarh is okay, sir. So you Not are... like Delhi. No, but in PGI, did you have a major COVID uh, section uh, for COVID patients? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have, yeah, yeah. The entire uh, one section of the hospital has been converted into COVID and uh, they are being looked after and stable patients are being treated elsewhere. Uh, slightly uh, far away from here. Right. So you, you are not roped into duties, no? I think medicine people and anesthesia people. No, no, sir. We are having it by turn. We are having it by turn. Emergency duties are shared by all. That also is by rotation. And COVID duties are being done. Right. How is Sanjay? Sanjay? Have you joined in? Sanjay Prakash? Uh, Dr. Sucharita, I think your internet connection is not very stable. Your video is freezing. So if you can just check or maybe you want to change your location. When you are presenting, it might be a problem. So what do I do? I am at home right now. I mean, uh, uh, I have, uh, this is through the landline that, that's the maximum speed that we get here. Okay, okay. And uh, I have my Jio uh, mobile that I can use for the network. If it comes to the... This is, this is what, MTN or uh, private? This is Airtel, sir. Airtel. So they say Airtel. they give maximum 40 Mbps, but what we get, uh, we're getting speed of around 8 or 9 maximum. Oh. Airtel, Airtel. Oh. If you could place your cell phone uh, maybe near a window or something to get the hotspot because uh, uh, your voice is breaking and it is lagging. So we uh, like few sentences we are unable to understand. Yeah, just just try out a few things as they are suggesting. I think that will help. How Sanjay? Sanjay, how are you? Yes, sir. Fine, sir. How are you, sir? Uh, how are you? Sanjay, how are you? Fine, sir. Are you fine, sir? Hi, Niren. Hi, Sanjay, sir. Nirendra, Ashish. And Ashish, how are you? Good. Niren, how what's the situation in Bhopal? Sir, it is now rapidly increasing. Now, uh, 100, 150 patients every day we are getting. Oh, my God. So, ICU is, our ICU is full. Okay. Ah, it is. It is basically. I think by by by. I think August end we'll see about a lack of case every day. That is going to happen. It's already 35, uh, around 35. And in fact, that is under reporting actually. Yes. <laughs> it must be much. I mean, much more. But uh, definitely by August end we're going to see about a lack of cases every day. How is Delhi? Delhi now, Devashish. Delhi actually has quietened down a bit because people have become really, you know, now they realize that a little bit that they're slightly afraid and they are a little bit, uh, you know, cautious, uh, at least in, in, in some of the sections like South Delhi or Central Delhi, but uh, some of the other sections like West Delhi and East Delhi, there is uh, still a lot of, uh, you know, person to person contact. So I think this is, I think, over overall, it is going to you know in an ebb and tide kind of a thing. It will keep on happening because until and unless you have a large section. So if the last ICMR you know data is correct, uh, that uh, only 0.7 percent zero positivity. So you can imagine that by by extrapolating it with uh, the population that is there, 
so already we have a large number going to have uh, you know with the doubling time we are going to have that so i i don't see any 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 change in that pattern as such it is just going to region wise it might slow down a bit again it will start off and then again the other regions will get affected you see that bangalore initially was yeah. so good it was held as a model you know now what's happening i mean so i think that it's it's because the nature of the pandemic is such that uh, the people will once you allow the people to travel and to you know mix uh, they will carry the virus knowingly or online knowingly and i was reading the latest of this thing uh, in fact even uh, the healthcare workers you know about 40 48% of the healthcare workers in one of the report was uh, actually asymptomatic so they are also you know kind of part of the game part of the chain so it is very difficult to prevent in fact how frequently do you think the healthcare workers should get their covid test done i don't know i mean that's a very politically sensitive question government is saying that you don't do it until and unless you become symptomatic because they fear that if you come positive then obviously the, there'll be a loss of manpower and things like that you know so but uh, they are nevertheless uh, spreaders there is no doubt about that And, so are you taking hcqs profile like sir uh, some of my colleagues have taken i have not taken so i because i don't see any any kind of rational and uh, uh, as such as of now but uh, let us see i mean in the name of covid lot of uh, experimental therapies are pumping in people are trying left and right and center you know anything that suits them and uh, also the vaccine trial has become a big joke because everybody is basically in a hurry to manufacture it and sell it so that they can get profits so we are 3 minutes away from the start should i open the room for the participants to join uh i think what do you say sir yeah so we keep our videos on or you want us to no right right now let it be on i will share my screen just to introduce what the first slide let the videos be on right now once the speaker starts then we can have all the videos and audios off you will okay. do it or we have to do it at our end i will do it not a problem i'll do it from here And hi hello i'm hi, just hi. opening the room so that you know the talk can then be accordingly yeah hi gagan good evening gagandeep sir good evening so dialog sir good evening evening hi gagan good evening good evening sir gagan is not able to hear he has to put this hello good evening sir hi hi thomas hi hello dr gandeep sir how are things hi gagan hi sir hi hi good afternoon sir hello sir fine sir all set yes, yes yeah. sir all set very good i and the right two more minutes sir yeah
Uh, how are things in Mumbai, sir? Uh, Mumbai is a shade better than what it was last week. So mm. let's hope uh, that another month we should be having a little bit of a flattening and uh, improvement in the situation. But mm. uh, still, beds are difficult to get. That's the uh, yardstick by which we should go. So mm -hmm. it's difficult to get, I think. Uh, that is what is the dilemma. Delhi is slightly better, no? Yeah, Delhi yeah. is slightly better in terms of, uh, you know, uh, bed situation because most of the people are doing home quarantine. So from that, and also the number of cases are slightly, you know, plateaued just because that people are now slightly more careful and, you know, uh, but I, I think that this is a temporary phenomena. This is going to change. Mm. What about your place, Yolanda? I don't know how long is. So. Yes. How many webinars a week do you do? No, no, I, I honestly don't do too. Um, you know, my if I start doing too much of webinars, uh, then my oh, home, not home minister, prime minister uh, <laughs> becomes very upset, you know. <laughs> it's one thing to go to a different city and attend a conference. Yes. You know, so there is no one you can easily say I'm I'm out of station and uh, I'm I'm not at. Friends or then then you cannot say that. <laughs> that's a big issue. I think it's time. Maybe it's also the best time, place time. to attend. Hmm. Babesh, what is the yes, sir? People have joined in, yes, yes, people are in already. We can start. Sir. So, should Gagan open the no? Gagan, you would like to open this webinar? Hello, Gagan, can you hear me? So I think his connection is not stable. He's uh, in and out. Okay. So, uh, so I start then the program. Uh, people have joined in the IN members, Babesh? Yeah, we have delegates uh, already in. Sir. Okay, right. 39 people are there. So, right. good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would request Dr. Gagandeep Singh to, you know, start the headache subsection webinar from the IN uh, perspective. He can, he can give us oh, a brief of the webinar. Uh, uh, the webinar is conducted by uh, IN, not the headache subsection that Dr. Ravi Shankar is going to talk about, but as such the IN programs. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you Devashish, but uh, um, actually I was to request you guys to, to start the headache uh, symposium or the webinar. Uh, in fact, uh, I have to say that um, right from the beginning, um, uh, I mean, as, as long as I can remember, the headache sub subsection has been really, really active and very, uh, some of the best um, uh, meetings, uh, face to face meetings uh, were of the headache uh, and uh, at very good locations also. So I've uh, really fond, and I think everyone in the end have fond memories of the wonderful meetings. And and uh, largely speaking, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar and uh, Dr. Debashish both have been instrumental in planning. And, and that is backed up by a very, very, very uh, young and uh, 
active and interested and motivated uh, uh, IN members who follow the head, headache subsection very nicely. So I think uh, it's all credit to both of you and credit to all the headache subsection members. Um, I would uh, really not uh, come in the way anymore and I would request Dr. Debashish to take on from here onwards, um, following which uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar would give a welcome address and, and also introduce the chief speaker and the subsequent yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gagandeep. And I really, we really appreciate the and acknowledge the great support of uh, Indian Academy of Neurology. Uh, President, our President, uh, Dr. Pramod Pal, uh, Secretary, Dr. Gagandeep Singh, President-elect, Dr. Murthy, and all the other members of the EC and the members of IN in general for supporting uh, and contributing to headache subsection. So now I request Dr. Uh, Ravi Shankar to kindly say a few words and just start off with the program. Uh, good evening, everybody, and it's a uh, warm welcome to all of you this evening. And uh, at the outset, again, I would like to thank Dr. Pramod Pal and Dr. Gagandeep Singh for all their support in uh, getting this uh, headache subsection webinar of the IAN off the ground. And uh, Dr. Devashish has uh, been instrumental in putting together an interesting program. We have a lot of uh, young neurologists also presenting good cases. And uh, we are happy to have with us uh, Dr. Alok Tyagi from Glasgow, who is the chief guest for this uh, uh, webinar. And he's going to be talking to us on a very difficult topic uh, that is chronic migraine, what we all face in tertiary practice. And after Dr. Alok Tyagi, we, uh, his talk, we will have a question answer session. And then we are going to have the cases being presented by the neurologists and uh, each one of them will have 10 minutes to present. And uh, the request is that uh, they should stick to their time. And we have two minutes uh, for discussion and uh, we will be uh, able to host only two questions per speaker. So I request you all to be ready to send your questions through the chat box. And Devashish and myself will take two of the most interesting questions pertaining to that case. So we will have, uh, in our, uh, I mean, in order to stick to time, we'll be able to take only two questions. And we hope to make this uh, as interesting a session as a webinar would allow. And we look forward to all of you staying on till the end. So Dr. Devashish will be introducing Dr. Alok Tyagi, and we look forward to a wonderful talk from him. Devashish. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So it's my uh, very, very pleasant duty and, and uh, really, you know, I have got a very, very uh, a deep uh, friendship with my friend and uh, uh, an uh, ex-alumnus from my institute, G.V. Panth Hospital, uh, Professor Alok Tyagi. He is a consultant neurologist and honorary senior lecturer and the lead clinician for headache uh, for the, at the Institute of Neurological Sciences, Queen Elizabeth University Hospital at Glasgow, United Kingdom. After completing his DM uh, from here, he went to UK and then he did the, um, uh, he has been working there since and he has taken, uh, you know, this headache field in UK in a big way and he is a very prominent member of BASH, uh, British uh, Association of the uh, Study of Headache. And uh, also, we had the opportunity of inviting him earlier during our iron cons. Uh, so, Alok, welcome. And uh, thank you for agreeing to deliver this talk uh, for the benefit of all our members. Because as we all know, that chronic migraine is really a problem uh, for all of us. And in India, it is under-recognized, under-treated. Uh, there is a huge problem uh, there. So, I would request to kind of, uh, you know, take us uh, to the what is the best possible scenario in managing chronic migraine. There we go. Right. Yeah. Can you hear me now, everyone? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank, thanks. Speak, David. speak a little louder, please. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you, Devashish, and thanks to the Indian Academy of Neurology for the invite to speak at the webinar today. Uh, as Devashish said, we, 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 we are both from the same Institute and the the plaque from G. B. Pant is is very prominently displayed on my on my mantelpiece. So 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 thanks very much, and it's it's lovely to be able to take the opportunity. Um, 
my uh, remit is to talk about the therapeutic advances in, in management of chronic migraine. And I'm gonna cover um, you know, uh, a lot of what uh, new treatment options we have, um, but the focus will be on treatments that have evidence base for um, uh, their use in chronic migraine. And perhaps uh, you know, a large part of the talk is going to be on the um, CGRP monoclonal antibodies. And I'll, and I'll try and give you a, a view, uh, perhaps my view, uh, in terms of you know the pace of these newer treatments in amongst all of the various treatment options that we have. Um, I will um, uh, put up my disclaimer slide. I think it's, it's important to do that. I have been the principal investigator for uh, pretty much all of the monoclonal antibodies and some of the neuromodulatory devices that um, uh, uh, we use in clinical practice, but I would uh, think and I would hope that that would not influence my the subject or the of the talk uh, or the content rather of my talk today. So we, we all see chronic migraine in clinical practice and we all see particularly chronic migraine because episodic migraineurs quite often do not uh, come and see medical practitioners and tend Excuse to me, treatments um, uh, uh, you know off the counter but uh, uh, Chronic migraine in particular is, as, as uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar and, and Dr. Devashish mentioned, it is, it is certainly a, a, a big part of clinical practice. Now, if oh, we so look your at... Is not, your screen is not shared in case you want to share your screen. Oh, is it not? All right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, let me just have a look. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go back to my um, disclaimer slide. I think it's important that I mention these. Uh, and and as, as, as mentioned, there's, there's been various um, uh, hospitalities and advisory boards, etc. So it's important that you are aware of this. So if you look at the um, treatment options that we have for for managing migraine, you know, these are the various oral treatments that are available. And I've also included botulinum toxin A here. And this is taken from the recently published uh, guideline, uh, uh, which we, we use in clinical practice here, the Scottish Inter Intercollegiate Guideline Network. You may want to refer to that as well. And, and each of these treatments has good evidence base for its use and are effective. And we all use these in clinical practice. Now, pretty much all of these, apart from botulinum toxin A, can be used for preventive treatment of both episodic and chronic migraine. But if you're looking for uh, clinical trial evidence um, of for use in chronic migraine, it's only there for topiramate. However, I think I, I would say this probably, uh, and this holds true for all of you as well, that uh, we would start off in, in most, if not all people with a beta blocker such as propranolol, and then consider a tricyclic. I tend to use more of nortriptyline. I find that its side effect profile is perhaps better than amitriptyline. Um, flunarazine is um, it's unlicensed in the UK, but I, I, I have used it extensively, uh, both here uh, as well as when I was practicing in, in India. Um, the one drug which uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all started using now, and I certainly have in the last few years, is candesartan, and it's a very good treatment option. Side effect profile is excellent and certainly worth considering. I would tend to use it now in preference to, to pyramid. Now, I'm not going to go into the, you know, the dosages and the side effect profile of each of these because I'm pretty sure you are aware of all of them. The problem with oral preventive treatments is that the, when we prescribe these, it often ends up that the patients do not take these medications. And this is not just a gut feeling. This is, there is clear evidence from the, uh, for this view. Uh, this is taken from a large U.S. claims database, which looked at almost uh, 9,000 patients who had migraine and who were prescribed preventive treatments. And when they looked at uh, patients at six months, only about a third were taking the preventive treatment that we, they were prescribed. And at the end of a year, it was only one in five who were taking the treatments. And that was across the board, whether it was an antihypertensive or an antidepressant or an anti-epileptic drug. And you could argue that the reason for this is that the migraine, the nature of the disorder is that it tends to get better 
And that's why people stop taking the medication. And that is true, but that's only in a fraction in about 10 to 15% of patients. In the vast majority, there are two reasons why people stop taking medications. One is that the treatments are not effective. And the second is that the people get side effects with these. And this is across the board, whether they are uh, at one end of the spectrum as drugs like topiramate, where the side effect profile tends to be quite uh, uh, horrendous. And on the other end is a drug like propranolol, where the side effect profile is better, but nevertheless, you still can get some. So, so this, is, this is a big problem with the oral treatments. And in the last few years, there's been a, 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 an explosion of non-oral treatment options that are available for uh, managing chronic migraine. And uh, particularly, I think five to six years ago, you know, every conference you would go, you would find you know, numerous posters on neuromodulatory treatments and stalls, which were, which were giving us various options. And, and out of all of those sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, plethora of, of neuromodulatory devices that we used, there are three which are currently available in clinical practice, which I'm sure you're aware of. There was a trend to use invasive neuromodulation as well. And I have to say my experience of using that for chronic migraine has not been particularly good. So it's not a treatment option that I currently recommend, particularly because there are so many other additional options that are available. So if you look at the, the first device that is used for treating chronic migraine, it can be, a, uh, it's a device called GammaCore. It's a non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator. And it's a mobile phone like uh, sized sort of device which you put on your neck and it's got a click wheel with which you can raise the intensity of the stimulus. And, and that is, um, uh, uh, it has clinical trial evidence to support its use. I have to say in my clinical practice, I tend to use it more for cluster headache where I think it certainly has um, a, a place in, in managing both the acute and uh, uh, as a preventive treatment. In migraine, um, the trial that, that's on the slide here uh, is thought to support its use. The big problem with this trial was the massive dropout rate. And you can see that from the, the slide here that you've got, this is looking at 50% responders, which means the proportion of patients who had a halving in the uh, number of their migraine or headache days. And that tends to increase the longer you use it. The problem with this, of course, is that the number of patients who are actually using the treatment tends to reduce significantly um, the longer they stay in the trial. So, so that's, that's a, a significant issue with uh, the gamma core device, but nevertheless, it certainly is an option. The second is, is a device called a transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, or stimulator. And the trial, the pivotal trial for this was, well, actually a decade ago. And this was um, uh, used in, in patients who, uh, who were having an acute migraine episode and, and although the, tri the trial did not meet the primary endpoint of headache relief, but there was a trend to improvement. Um, this is an option which one could use in a couple of situations. Uh, one is if you have patients who've got uh, chronic migraine or repeated episodes of migraine, where migraine aura is the predominant symptom. And there's some suggestion based on the, the uh, basic science uh, studies looking at TMS devices that um, that it may be a useful treatment in that, in that scenario. And the other is that there's some suggestion that if you have a pregnant patient, you could use a TMS device fairly safely. I have to say it's, 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 a, it's a rare occasion where you do need to do that. Majority of women find that their migraines get better during pregnancy. The ones you don't, you could use a, 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 an oral preventive drug such as um, propranolol in the first two trimesters or a tricyclic throughout the pregnancy. But if you do want to consider this or if a patient wants to consider this, uh, then it is, it is an option. And the third device is, is a device called the Kefli or Cephali, and it's an external trigeminal nerve stimulator device. And this is an interesting one because the manufacturer, it's a Belgian firm, which, which essentially uh, built the device and then started selling it. And you can get it on Amazon for a couple of hundred pounds. Um, there is a, a phase three trial that supports its use, but um, there were considerable problems with the trial in terms of the matching of the patient and the um, other treated and the placebo group, and also the question of unblinding. But nevertheless, the post-marketing marketing data for this, as it is with the TMS device, um, uh, suggests that 
uh, patients would recommend it. The big plus with each of these is that the side effect profile is really uh, minuscule. You know, there are really no major side effects uh, to talk about at all. Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, a treatment option uh, which one could have if oral preventive treatments are not being considered. But the big story, of course, as you all know, is that of the CGRP and its related uh, treatment options. CGRP exists in two forms. The one which interests us as neurologists and as headache doctors is the alpha CGRP, and that is involved in the transmission of pain. And primarily the, uh, in, in migraine, it, its uh, role or its um, place is because CGRP um, is, is primarily um, present in the trigeminal cervical complex, which as you know, is the epicenter in terms of the migraine pathophysiology. The problem is with CGRP, of course, is that it is also widely distributed in the uh, body and it um, uh, mediates vasodilatation. So there have been potential concerns with CGRP antagonism that uh, what happens to the blood pressure of people who go on these treatments um, and what happens, I mean, that's the big sort of unknown, what happens if somebody who is on a, a medication which is blocking the CGRP system and then they develop either a uh, a stroke or, a, or, a, or an MI and what is their response going to be? W would it be different to someone who's not on a CGRP um, um, uh, antagonist or a monoclonal antibody? So these are somewhat answer unanswered questions uh, and, and which I'm sure we'll get to know the longer we use these treatments. Uh, it is, however, important to say that uh, none of the trials and none of the studies that we are looking at so far and none of the uh, data that's coming through uh, suggest that there is a major problem with these. However, bear in mind that the patient population that are using these, uh, they are screened fairly carefully before they go on to these treatments. The CGRP and migraine story goes back again, back to the 80s and 90s. And this is data from Peter, uh, Peter Goldsby's and Lars Edvinson's uh, labs, which essentially showed that during a migraine attack, the level of CGRP increases. And if you use sumatriptan, it not only improves the headache, but it leads to a reduction in the level of CGRP. And sumatriptan, as you know, it is a 5-HD1B1D receptor agonist, but the primary uh, or the uh, molecule that it's working on is, the CG is CGRP. And based on this lab uh, data, a number of uh, drugs were developed in the late 90s and early 2000s called GPANS. And, and uh, each of these, the, 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 initial, the first one was called Segepant, and each of these was effective in treating the acute migraine episode. And one of them called telsegepant was also used as a preventive treatment. And that's when the problems happen that patients developed. Uh, there were a few reports of hepatotoxicity and all of these trials were shelved. However, out of that debris, three uh, 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 receptor antagonist uh, molecules have uh, come out and are being trialed and have been studied in the treatment of migraine. Two of these, Remigipant and Ubrojipant, are licensed for use now in the US for acute treatment of migraine. Etogipant, which is the third molecule which has been bought over by Allergan, has um, a phase 2b trial looking at the, as a preventive treatment for episodic migraine. And we were going to be starting recruiting for a phase three trial for the use of etogipant in chronic migraine before the pandemic happened. But hopefully that's gonna get back on track in the near future. I don't know if you, you are involved in the trials uh, for this molecule as well. So there's the big advantage of these is that these are tablet options. And in fact, one of them is also a nasal spray. So that's the big plus as compared to the monoclonal antibodies, which are all injectable. And if we now talk about the monoclonal antibodies, there are four of them, again, as, as you're probably all aware. Uh, the, the, you could broadly divide them into two groups. One would be a monoclonal antibody that is inhibiting functioning at the CGRP receptor, thereby it leaves all the other calcitonin family receptors intact. And the exemplar of this is erinimab. And the other group is our monoclonal antibodies, which are acting on the ligand and not on um, the receptor itself. Therefore, um, uh, sorry, uh, and therefore affecting all of the uh, um, uh, receptors as compared to erenumab, which only acts at the CGRP receptor. 
And there are three of these uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, frimenizumab, gelkinizumab, and etinizumab. Now, three of these four are currently available um, uh, in the UK where I live and work. Um, and that would be erinumab, which is marketed as Amovig, frimenizumab as Ejovi, and gelkinizumab as Emgality. The eptinizumab uh, molecule is not yet licensed in the UK, but um, probably will be in the near future. Now, each of the, the three that we have available are used as subcutaneous or given as subcutaneous injections. And this is done by the patient themselves, whereas eptinizumab is an intravenous drug. For the three subcutaneous uh, molecules, Amovig has two dosages, and the trials have looked at both dosages of 70 and 140 milligrams. Ejovi, there are two dosage strengths as well. There's a 225 milligrams monthly and a 675 milligrams three monthly, although uh, the trial was slightly more complex than what this would suggest. And then you have Mgality, which has two doses of 120 and 240. We're focusing on chronic migraines. So uh, uh, we, we look at some of the um, uh, trials that have been done. I'm not gonna go into too much of detail about the trials themselves, but this is just a summary slide. Uh, um, and we look at the Fremenizumab trial uh, uh, a little bit more, but this is a summary slide of all of the four antibodies um, that have been used for chronic migraine. Now you will notice that Erinumab does not have a phase three trial. It had a large phase two B trial which was um, accepted as a, as a, or data from it was accepted as a phase three uh, data by most uh, regulatory authorities. And certainly in Scotland, the SMC or the Scottish Medicines Consortium uh, uh, recommended its use in chronic migraine based on the data from that trial. The other three molecules, um, uh, uh, monthly migraine days was the primary endpoint. Fremenizumab had a, a definition of a monthly headache days, which was of moderate to severe intensity, uh, but it roughly equates to a monthly migraine day. The baseline days were about just under 20 in the Gelkinizumab trial and just over 16, uh, 15, or just over 16 in the other two. And the time frame was uh, up to three months. If you look at the Fremenizumab trial, the randomization was one is to one is to one. So you either had a, a, an arm which had frenizumab quarterly, so you had a single dose of 675 at baseline, followed by two doses of placebo, or you had the same dose at baseline followed by two doses of 225 milligrams each, and then you had a third arm of placebo. What is interesting to note here, and this is across the board in all of the MAP trials, is that the patients were, they were allowed to continue taking their acute medication. So if they had medication overuse, um, then they were still recruited in the trial, except if they were overusing opioids, which is a, a considerable problem in the UK, or barbiturates, which is a considerable problem in the US. So if people were overusing um, simple analgesics or anti-inflammatories or tryptans, they were still uh, uh, recruited into the trial. If you look at the primary end, uh, of the endpoints, both primary and secondary, uh, on, your, on your left here is a slide which depicts the, the results. The Fremenizumab monthly arm, which is the 675 at baseline, followed by two 225 doses, uh, that led to um, uh, 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 a reduction uh, in the number of migraine days or severe headache days by 4.6 days, as compared to the baseline of just over 16 days. Whereas in the quarterly arm, it was slightly lower at 4.3 as compared to a reduction in the placebo uh, group, which was by 2.5 days. And the difference between the placebo and treated arms in both was st statistically significant. And we'll come to what, you know, what does that really mean in, in, in clinical practice? If you then look at the secondary endpoint, which is the 50% responder rates, which is looking at the proportion of patients who had essentially a halving of their baseline uh, moderate to severe headache days. And in both the treated arms, that sat at about 40%, whereas in the placebo arm, it was just under 20%, which means that two out of five of the patients who went on to the frimenizumab treatment arm um, uh, uh, had a uh, halving of their migraines as compared to baseline. Uh, this is important because this is this is one of the sort of selling points, so to say, for the monoclonal antibodies in that their side effect profile was fairly good. 
And this is a summary of the uh, uh, side effects which are reported in more than 2% of the patients in any group. And, and this is what we see in clinical practice, uh, that injection site reactions such as pain or, or a bit of redness or itching is not uncommon. Uh, a bit of flu-like sort of symptoms, a bit of nasopharyngitis, uh, people do complain of, but none of these really bother them. And neither does uh, 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 some reports of dizziness and nausea. What is reported and which is not reported in the clinical trial, but is said to us by patients using these treatments is constipation. And that seems to be a, a fairly frequently reported uh, side effects. The other one which I've come across, which, uh, you know, which could have multiple reasons, of course, is hair loss alopecia. Um, so uh, it's one to, to watch out for as, as we just, uh, use these treatments more. If you look at the Galkinizumab trial, it's what's called the REGAIN study. And, and the trial design is, is fairly similar across the board for all of the MABs. You've got a screening phase, you've got a baseline phase from one, and then a double blind phase. Here again, there were three arms. The Galkinizumab, 240 milligram arms. So you had three injections of this strength. In the 120 arm, the baseline dose was 240, followed by two doses of 120. And then you had an open label phase followed by a safety uh, 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 study. Uh, and the results were very similar to what you see in the Freminizumab trial in that both the treated arms, the 120 and the 240, there was a significant reduction uh, in the migraine days as compared to placebo. Um, and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, this is, as I said, replicated across the, the MABs. Now, this is a summary slide, but I've tried to sort of look at absolute numbers. And this is looking at each of the, uh, the, uh, the three subcutaneous MABs that are available to us uh, in the UK. So this is looking at Erinimab. And what you're looking at here is this is the placebo arm. This is the 70 milligram arm and this is the 140 arm, and this is the phase 2b trial, as I said. So in the placebo arm, the baseline mean monthly migraine days were 18.2, and uh, the final mean monthly migraine days were 13.8. So there was a, an absolute reduction by 4.2 days as compared to baseline in the placebo arm. And in the two erinimab-treated arms, that reduction was by 6.6 .6 days. So you're looking at absolute numbers not the statistically significant uh, uh, bits, which, which often are, are the sort of key markers in, in clinical trials. If you look at Freminizumab, I'm sorry, there's the, uh, uh, I need to correct the, the labeling here. This is the placebo arm, whereas the reduction was by 3.2 days. And these are the two treated arms and very similar in the Gelkenizumab trial. So, so you can see that, yes, there's a placebo arm, there's a, there's a reduction, but the reduction in the treated arms uh, is, is significant, both statistically as well as in the absolute number. But what does that really mean? And what does that mean to us as clinicians? You know, these are, are these treatments better than what we have, you know, in terms of the pathophysiological relevance, but perhaps much more so for efficacy. Are they more effective? Are they more better tolerated? Is the safety profile really better? And most importantly, in healthcare systems, such as the one that I work, um, the cost of the drug is hugely relevant to the, um, to the government and to the uh, healthcare system. And for uh, uh, in India, of course, it's important if you're working in the government sector, but majority uh, of the private uh, uh, um, or self-funding patients, you know, cost is a major issue. So really, other monoclonal antibodies, if we look at everything together, then is this a better package to have? So let's look at some of these aspects. If you talk about pathophysiology, I think there's no question that the CGRP monoclonal antibodies are the, are the ones where the, the mode of action is the best explained because we do know, and I haven't gone into it today because it's not in the remit of this talk, but CGRP is the cornerstone in migrant pathophysiology. So if you've got a treatment which is which is uh, attacking that, then that has the best basis for its use. But what about botulinum toxin? This is a treatment we use reasonably extensively now, and some would say is a standard of care in chronic migraine. How does that work? Um, there is a, a, a trend to say that the, C, the uh, botulinum toxin also works through the CGRP system. There's also some suggestion 
that uh, there is um, the, the, the injectable treatment. It not only works at the site, but at uh, distant sites as well. But perhaps it's not as clear cut as with the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. And then what about all of the, the various uh, preventive, oral preventive treatments we use? You know, they are disparate. There's, they are antihypertensives, they are anti-epileptics, they are uh, antidepressants. And how do they all work? Now, this is from an animal model which looked at cortical spreading depression uh, in a control. And then when each of these medications were used, and there is some suggestion that the use of these medications reduces cortical spreading depression. And that's how they work as preventive treatments for migraine but it's not as clear cut. So in terms of pathophysiology, I think the CGRP monoclonal antibodies certainly have a more clear cut basis as compared to all of the other options that we have. But what about effectiveness? That's the one which really we bank on, you know, are these treatments really more effective? Now, there's a lot of, lot of discussion about placebo responses and, and there's been a lot of uh, debate about how high the placebo responses have been for the botulinum toxin trial and for the uh, CGRP monoclonal antibody trials. But if you compare them with oral medication trials, you know, treatments like topiramate, which is a, a gold standard in a way as a preventive treatment for migraine. And this is one of the, uh, the few trials done in chronic migraine. The placebo response here is, is pretty much the same as it has been in the injectable trials. If you look at the effectiveness for in the topiramate arm, the reduction from baseline of 17.1 uh, uh, migraine migraine stays was by 6.4 in the topiramate arm and 4.7 in the placebo arm. Now this was statistically significant, but is it clinically significant? And that's where the concept of the population therapeutic gain comes in that, you know, in clinical trials, patients get better for a variety of reasons, but does it really help to know whether the drug is really effective? Is statistical significance, does that translate into clinical significance on the ground? So this concept of measure of a population therapeutic gain comes in, which is simply measured by reducing the placebo response from the, from the response in the treatment arm. So for topiramate, that stands at about 1.7 days. So in simple terms, you could say that taking topiramate results in 1.7 days more of migraine freedom as compared to taking placebo. This is a simplistic view, but this is to take us away from all the myriad of, of issues that statistical significance has, which is of course the gold standard in, in clinical trials. If you look at botulinum toxin, again, this trial was pillared because it had a high placebo response. In the, in the uh, treated arm, the reduction was by 8.4 days from a baseline of just under 20 days, whereas in the placebo arm, the reduction was 6.6 .6 days. So if you translate or if you calculate the population therapeutic gain, it's just around the same as it is in the topiramate trial. And what about the MABs? If you look at erinimab here, and I've looked at erinimab because this was the drug which was first licensed and approved in the UK for chronic migraine. If you look at erinimab in chronic migraine, uh, you can see that the population therapeutic gain for each of these treatment arms is about 2.4 days. So again, you could argue uh, it's not really enough, is it, for us to, to look at these treatments, but it certainly is a wee bit more than the, uh, the currently available treatments that we have. Now, how much more, how substantially more, I think that's open for discussion. If you then look at what the, the, the concept of 50% responder rates, which is a, a commonly used secondary uh, endpoint, and you can see that uh, you could argue this is not comparing like for like because these are episodic migraine trials and the botulinum toxin and the MAB, erinumab are chronic migraine trials. But nevertheless, if you look at candesartan, propranolol or topiramate, each of these, the 50% responder rate sits at just over 40, right? So you've got about 40% of patients who are taking these medications who achieve a halving in their migraine days as compared to baseline. Just a little bit more in the botulinum toxin arm, but you've got a higher placebo response here and roughly the same in the monoclonal antibody. So if you're looking at 50% responder rates, it's fairly similar. However, nobody is saying that the monoclonal antibodies are to be used instead of oral medications. You're only, wherever you practice in the world, you are only going to use it in people 
who have failed the standard available treatments for a variety of reasons. Um, one is as doctors, we like to give pills, but the other is that these are treatments that have been available for a long, long time. We're all very comfortable using them. So you're not going to use the monoclonal antibodies in preference to the oral treatment options. But in patients who have failed these treatments, there is clinical trial evidence to support the use of monoclonal antibodies in patients who have failed up to four treatment options, both for galcanizumab and freminizumab. What is interesting in the freminizumab trial is to look at the placebo responses. They're very low, which again would, su would suggest that this is not the treatment naive group, which often is used in clinical trials. So these are patients who have tried and failed treatment. And so their expectation of a treatment response would be lower than in, in the treatment naive group. And even in this group, you find that there is a significant reduction, both statistically and perhaps in clinically meaningful terms in, in, in the number of migraine days as compared to baseline. And then what about the tolerability and adherence? If you look at adverse events reported in the tupirimid trials, they were in the high, above the 80%. And similarly in botulinum toxin trials, it was high. In an erinumab trial as well, it was high, but not as much as in the other two. But the biggest marker for tolerability is the dropout rates. So if you compare the dropout rates in the tupirimid trial, which was uh, just under 11%, in the erinumab trial, it was half a percent. So, so the tolerability of these treatments is certainly better than the oral treatments that are available. And this is just a slide that we have seen before. I will, however, state and, and re-emphasize that patients who have major cardiovascular disease, particularly hypertension, which is not well controlled. There's no real safety data available. And the big one, what about the cost? Now this is a uh, uh, cost in the UK, but uh, I'm sure it translates the, the proportion of difference translates the same as in India. For amitriptyline, you look at the cost per year at about nine pounds, whereas for the MABs, it sits at over 4,600 pounds per year. So there's a significant difference. So as I said, we're not going to use these treatments in preference to the oral ones. And where I work, uh, this is a sort of algorithm that we would only use the monoclonal antibodies and chronic migraine, where one, you've addressed medication overuse, two, you've tried pretty much all the options that are available, and three, at the moment, we use them only in Botox non-responders. But if once we audit our data at the end of the year, year and we find that these treatments are as effective, if not better, then this might change. But certainly we would not be using it in preference to the oral treatment options. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. Sorry, that's me for my stress. Thank you, Alok. That that was a, an excellent lecture and uh, you took us through the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies perfectly. We got a complete overview of when to use, when not to use and how efficacious they are. So now we'll take the questions from the audience and uh, Devashish, how do you want to go about it? So you, you need to unmute yourself, Devashish. Hello. Uh, you can you can look at the chat box, sir, and then start. Okay. So we have uh, three questions. Uh, in fact, there are just two questions uh, which are not directly related to the topic under question. Uh, one is about triggers for migraine and the role of the gut-brain axis. How important is the gut-brain axis, in your opinion, in the... Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. It's not, um, you know, one that I have uh, much sort of uh, experience of or, or knowledge of. It's, I mean, the gut-brain axis has been, has been talked about in a number of things, uh, you know. Um, there certainly is a role of you know, migraineurs often have GI symptoms, of course, if that's what you're referring to. But in terms of the pathophysiological basis, um, you know, I'm not 
I'm not sure that there is much that I can I can I can say on that. Let me ask you a question from my side. Uh, if you have just one attack in two months, three months of severe sporadic hemiplegic migraine, have you uh, had any patient where you've used the anti-CGRP maps in uh, hemiplegic migraine and would you use it in such a situation because it's not coming under the true indication, but would you use it in a sporadic hemiplegic migraine? No, uh, I wouldn't use it in that scenario. Uh, there is a, a, an indication of high frequency episodic migraine, particularly for freminezumab, but that would be in patients who have between sort of 10 to 14 migraine days in a month. For someone who has episodes of once every three months, I probably mainly focus on trying to manage the acute episode rather than use a preventive treatment. Now, it could be that there is some suggestion in the eptinizumab trial that the effect from it is evident within 24 hours. Um, so it may be that if and when that comes on uh, in terms of availability for us, that that may be an option. So, uh... There is another question uh, there uh, about the diagnostic uh, criteria. So you use ICSD-3 or somebody is asks, asking about the Silverstein, old Silverstein criteria? No, no, we stick to ICSD-3. Right. So I think uh, we should all stick to ICSD-3. So my question to Alok will be this, that uh, Alok, uh, you know, now, of course, the cost is very high. But uh, seeing the seemingly, you know, very nice adverse uh, effect profile, ease of, you know, giving the drug once in a month or once in three months, uh, no titration required, right? And, uh, you know, uh, so all these are plus plus win-win situations, right? So if uh, more and more the drug is used, the cost might come down as we've seen in other uh, drugs. And for example, now we have just completed the Empower study uh, from in, involving India, China, and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, and Latin America, part of Latin America. So uh, I think with more usage, do you think foresee that its uh, use will increase and it is going to change the way we treat migraine? And secondly, about the cost effectiveness of this versus Botox in, in, in terms of uh, treating chronic migraine. Like for Botox injections, the patient has to come in, you have to prepare, there's a charge for the sisters and, you know, everything is there. And this would be, you know, just uh, self-medication at home. So it will make come out much cheaper than the Botox. Yeah, yeah I, I think if I answer your second question first, uh, in terms of the cost effectiveness or comparison with the Botox, the, the drive, uh, certainly in the UK, what's happened is the cost that I gave you on my slide is the cost if you buy the drug. But what uh, bodies like NICE and the SMC have done is that they have struck a deal with the pharmaceutical firm in that the actual cost to the NHS is going to be roughly, you know, a, a, a significantly less amount as compared to the, the list price of the drug, which is roughly just over what it is for the botulinum toxin. So I think cost wise, you're absolutely right that I think it, there will be a drive to cut down the cost of these treatments at the moment. Botulinum toxin still, even if you look at the cost of the personnel, it still is a bit cheaper. And particularly if you use drugs like Xeomin, which some people do, which we don't, but you know that could drive the, the cost further down. Um, the, the fact about, well, overall, if we start to use these more, I think we've got to watch the space because the big one, I think, would be to look at you know multi the large amounts of data that comes in, particularly in terms of their cardiovascular safety. And I think that once that question is answered, initially when we started using them, we were monitoring blood pressures for everyone, but we don't do that now because it's not really required. Unless somebody has uncontrolled hypertension, you really don't need to monitor it. So, you know, um, I think the more experience one gains, the more comfortable one would be for using it. So, I think so the, other question, the other question is with regards patient preference. Now, undoubtedly patients will prefer to use a treatment once a month, which they can do at home, rather than come into a hospital setting and get 31 injections on the head. Okay. So, you know, there is no question that patients would prefer the, the, the maps. Right. So another question related to this that uh, is has come that which map is better? I mean, is there any study now to look at the differential roles of these maps and uh, 
whether they will have some effect in patients who have a significant comorbid depression? Yeah, so frimenizumab, there is a, there is a, a trial which is, again, it's all got shelved because of the pandemic, but that is being looked at patients who've got, you know, looking at frimenizumab in patients with chronic migraine with comorbid depression. So, you know, it'll be useful to, to, to watch the space and see, um, you know, if there's a particular role in, in that for this, this map. I'm not aware of, um, you, you know, you look at clinical trials and you try and extrapolate the data and you try and, but it's very difficult to come to a definite conclusion that one is better than the other. You could argue, well, they work differently. One works at the ligand and the other one works at the receptor. So perhaps the ligand would work better than the receptor. That's one of the 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 uh, the sort of views given by some pharmaceutical firms. But I'm not so sure. I think we have to watch and look at the data. And what we are trying to do now, because we've got opportunity to have both erinimab and frenizumab, is to give them one, you know, uh, in in tandem, and then audit the results and see that in real life and clinical practice, is there really a difference? in the outcomes in uh, uh, when you compare yeah. one to the other. Uh, someone raised a very important question that, you know, CGRP antagonists, uh, uh, as you say, that they are the vasodilators and you were blocking the vasodilatation and triptans are also uh, vasoconstrictors. So, so if you give in these patients the triptans, uh, are there any, uh, any, any problems or uh, they are contraindicated? What's your take on that? No, no, we don't, we don't restrict the use of triptans with the monoclonal antibodies at all. Okay. There's right. one question from Dr. Partha Ray. How many of your patients who are on monoclonal antibodies are still continuing their oral prophylactics or Botox uh, periodically? Yeah. So uh, again, the, uh, the with regards the Botox, the question is easier to answer because at the moment that that is zero because the way the the healthcare system is, we would only use the MABs in Botox non-responders. So, so we don't have many, in fact, pretty much zero patients who are on both injectable treatments. But yes, there are a proportion of patients who are taking Topiramate or Candesartan or Propranolol. I can't give you figures, um, you know, uh, which we need to look at the audit, but you would have certainly have a proportion. What I've also noted uh, uh, in clinical practice is that there are patients who are on the MABs who find that yes, there's been a reasonable response, but not as good as they would like. And if you then add in one of the preventive treatments, which may have had some benefit to them in the past, then you find that the, the efficacy can be compounded. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Aloxa, very excellent and crisp presentation. How fast do the action come? When you give a Erinumab or something subcutaneous, how fast do the action come? And do they have any effect on status migranosis? Yeah, you know, I, th I think the action can be noted. Again, you know, I, and I say this to all my patients that this is not a cure. This is not definitely something which will work 100% for everyone right from the moment you take it. But you've got a proportion of people. So you've got, in my view of this, about 60% of patients note improvement with it. And about a third of them perhaps note an improvement fairly quickly. So if you, if you, uh, you know, extrapolate that into, into clinical usage, I would think that about one in five notice a reasonably good response fairly quickly. However, what our standard protocol is that we would use the drug for three months and then make an assessment and, and, and see. So, because you may have a proportion of patients who don't get a response in a month but they may get in the second or third month. Whereas on the other hand, you would have a smaller proportion respond fairly quickly. The other question with regards to the status migranosis, uh, I think eptinizumab, which is the intravenous form of the drug, yeah. there may be a role for that. But you know, I have no personal experience of it in that situation, but we need so, to watch it. Uh, Alok, in the initial study of eptinizumab, uh, there was this you know, first 48 hours, uh, they, they had some data yeah. to show that the first 48 hours, the pain relief was quite significant. Yeah. So probably from yeah. that context, it might be later yeah. on. I will... Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Dr. Ravi Shankar, do you want to ask any question? Any, there uh, are a few more. I have one question. There are yeah. some, but uh, in the interest of time, we will take only, we have exhausted all the questions related to the MABs. 
So the other questions, some of them are related to the oral prophylactics like topiramate induced glaucoma and other things. So we will move on with the short yes. case. And uh, we request you, Alok, also to stay on to, uh, to listen to our uh, young neurologists presenting their short cases. So the first one I would like to invite is Dr. Thomas Matthew. He is the head of the department at St. John's uh, in Bangalore. So Thomas, with your presentation, please. Thank you, sir. I'll just share my screen and start. Has it come, sir? The screen has come? Yes. Sir, can I start? Please. <clears throat> A very good evening to all, and it's my pleasure to present this case before our esteemed uh, senior colleagues, Dr. Ravishanka and Dr. Dabashish and all the viewers. And I thank the subsection Indian Academy for permitting us to present this case and uh, a wonderful presentation from Dr. Alok. And let me start this case. And uh, uh, it's a case of refractory cluster headache. And uh, I'll tell you how this as the story evolves, how the mystery was solved. So it's a story of a 27 year old young software professional who was referred by a colleague of mine for refractory cluster headache in the, on the 3rd of February, 2020. And he's my colleague, Dr. Mahindra Javali. He's in, uh, uh, working in a uh, hospital here and he's an excellent uh, neurologist and uh, uh, he's in Ramaya. And uh, when he referred this patient, I was surprised why Dr. Mahindra referred a cluster headache to me because most of our Indian clusters respond well to treatment. So the story was, uh, the patient was suffering from cluster headache for the past nine years from 2011. And interestingly, he was a patient of Dr. P.K. Sethi. And all of us know Dr. P.K. Sethi, it's a senior colleague, a wonderful human being and a wonderful doctor. And Dr. P.K. Sethi was treating him for the last four or five years. And his cluster headaches uh, attacks used to last two to three per year. And usually used to come in January, February, June, July, and October, November. And usual cluster periods used to last four to five weeks and it improved. And he was uh, uh, happy with the uh, you know, uh, treatment and he used to work in four to five weeks, his cluster used to subside. And the attacks used to happen on the left V1 distribution excruciating pain, associated watering of eyes, redness of eyes, eye drooping, and duration of attacks were two hours and used to happen alternate days from usually early morning, he used to get from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And that acute attacks were relieved with oxygen inhalation. And usually the treatment given to him was 40 to 80 milligram of verapamil three times and a short course of ice loan over one to two weeks, usually used to take around 20 milligram and at times he used to take sumatriptan for attacks and attacks at the cluster periods subsided over four to five weeks. And this time in January, 2019, he had his usual cluster attack, which lasted four to five weeks. But in March, a bit early, the cluster episode reoccurred and it subsided. But again in July, the cluster started coming and it started increasing in frequency, intensity and duration. From alternate days, the cluster started becoming daily and the intensity increased 10 to 15 percent than the baseline cluster headache freak, uh, intensity, and the duration increased from two to three hours. So this cluster attacks uh, continued the entire 2019, and on January of 2020, so almost for six months, and then he came to visit me on 3rd February. He was on verapamil 80 milligram three times a day and topiramide 50 milligram twice a day, and that was he was taking. I was a little perplexed because uh, usually we don't have much refractory chronic uh, cluster headache patients. And, uh, uh, you know, we th I thought, is it really a case of uh, truly refractory chronic cluster headache? Then we have to report this case because we rarely see um, chronic cluster headache. And this is a slide from uh, pre COVID era when people used to travel. And you can see uh, most of our, these are the Indian delegates who attended the international. Uh, a master class on headache in Sydney. And uh, in this meeting, we could meet uh, the, all the stalwarts in the field of medicine. You can see this Dr. Jun and Dr. Peter Godsby. And in Jun used to say there are 
no uh, chronic cluster in China, Japan, India. We don't have chronic cluster headache. Then I was surprised and thought that this may be a truly a chronic uh, cluster headache we are seeing. But you know, we have to wait for some more time to uh, criteria wise say chronic cluster, but an unabated cluster going on. So I was thinking that what to do next, whether to give a greater hospital now block or change the medicines and things like that. I was thinking. Then as the case now, because of our experience with epileptic patients and migraine patients, we used to ask, are you using, using any complementary on alternative medicine? Are you on any homeopathic medicines? Are you, are you on Ayurvedic medicines? Are you applying any types of balms or oils or which contains any proconvulsant essential oils? So I used to ask all these things and he told I'm not using anything, I'm not using any balms. Then nowadays I used to ask uh, one more question to most of my, my patients of epilepsy and migraine. So I asked him also the same question. Uh, what is the toothpaste you are using? And that is a question I don't know, know whether it will have a bearing on his case, but most of our my epilepsy, migraine, and anxiety now, I ask this question because many of the toothpaste which are marketed contain eucalyptus and camphor, two uh, proconvulsant essential oils. And he told I'm using a paste called Patanjali Dantakanti. Then I asked him how long you are using it. He told I'm using it from February, 2019. And then I searched the content of Patanjali Dantakanti and uh, in the Google and it found that it has many components around 15 natural herbs and one of them was camphor. And then uh, I just told him the concept behind the uh, migraine, epilepsy, uh, cluster headache. There are uh, hyper excitable neurons with increased currents. And I believe that the essential oils may trigger epilepsy, trigger migraine. Uh, and I told him, can you just stop this toothpaste for my sake? and maintain a headache diary and just continue the same medicines uh, Mahindra was giving. He agreed and he told, sir, anyway, I have suffered uh, uh, six months or six and a half months. If you want me to do this, I'll do that. And I will maintain the headache diary and just come after two weeks and then you decide what to do. So I was, um, he agreed and I just kept my fingers crossed and I just told, asked him to come after two weeks. And to my surprise, when he came after two weeks, he's very happy. He told, for, sir, for the past four days, I have no headache. My, uh, then I asked how it happened. He told when I stopped the toothpaste, it started decreasing in intensity and duration of the cluster in the first week. It came down almost 50%. And after the 10 days in the last four days, it disappeared. So I was a bit surprised to see such a result. And then uh, he, um, I, you know, he, uh, I, he didn't come back after that. Then in May, I called him because I had his uh, phone number and mail ID. He told me, sir, I have no headache. And he told he has already reduced his topiramate by himself to one tablet and stopped it in March after one month. And next he himself reduced the verapamil from thrice a day to twice a day and it stopped in April. And just before this presentation, three days back again, I called him and he told I have no headache and no cluster attacks. So it was a very interesting revelation for us that simple things may affect your migraine cluster and epilepsy. And then, uh, and I'll just briefly say about headache and essential oils. This is a paper we just recently published in January 2020 in Kefalalgia case reports. This was a case of a 14 year old boy who was referred to me for a chronic daily headache of one year. He was refractory to four anti-migraine drugs, including valproate, topramate, amitriptyline, and beta blockers. And he was daily applying a balm called Amrudanjan, which contained 10% camphor and 14% uh, eucalyptus. And we just stopped this application of the balm and in two weeks, his headache crashed down to almost no headache. And I stopped all his anti-migraine drugs over a period of three months. And it is almost, uh, uh, you know, follow up of one and a half, two years, and he has no headache. And this we reported that. And this, uh, this was long back in that meeting in 2018 when we used to see uh, patients with eucalyptus induced headaches and Wicks and Tiger Balm induced um, um, seizures and headache. I shared this with uh, Peter Godsby. And unlike uh, most of our Indian colleagues, Peter, Peter Godsby was. Uh, very open to this suggestion and he was very interested in this what I told and he told Thomas I'm just going to send you an article today night please go through that article so he sent me this article on headache tree I'm not sure how much you how many of you have heard of headache tree the headache tree this was an article published in brain in 2011 on uh, on the headache tree I'll just tell more about the headache tree and there is a tree called uh, um, the California bay leaf. It comes like, you know, it's, a, it's called Umbeluria californica. The scent of this plant triggers cluster headache. So the inhalation of the vapors or even smelling of the leaves of this uh, California bay laurel or Umbeluria california produces severe cluster headache, headache 
crisis and sometimes seizures. So in the headache tree, they isolated, this is almost 11 centers across the world, across the world Italy, UK, US and Brazil, sat together on this uh, simple case report and identified what is the active component which triggers uh, headache. And they found that in California, Bay Laurel or Umbelluleria, California, there is some monotherapy in ketone called Umbelulone, and it stimulates the transient receptor potential anchor in one channel in a subset of peptidar peptidergic nociceptive neurons, and it activates the trigeminovascular system. And the Umbelulone evokes a calcium dependent release of calcitonin gene related peptide and which causes vasodilatation in the meningeal vessels. And we have just seen Dr. Alok telling about the importance of calcitonin gene-related peptide. So we have calcitonin gene-related peptide, vasoactive intertinal peptide, substance P, and neurokinin, and of which the most potent is calcitonin gene-related peptide among the algogenic neuropeptides. And the, in both migraine and clusters, when you take during the take the blood from the external jugular vein and check you can see that calcitonin gene-related peptide levels are increased. And these are all important works of the last 25, 30 years from Peter Godspeed, and which led to the, all this research on calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor blockers and antibodies. The essential oils of 11 plants are powerful convulsants, especially camphor, eucalyptus, rosemary, fennel, hyssop, pennyroil, oil, and all this stuff. And uh, you can see that epilepsy and migraine are uh, paroxysmal brain disorders involving uh, paroxysmal depolarization shift in epilepsy and a cortical spreading depression or excitation of the brain. We have status epileptica, status myognosis, and we have seen most of the things are same. And both uh, pro-convulsant essential oils can to the migraine. And here we are telling that even cluster headaches, this might be important. And these are all the similarities between epilepsy and migraine. And usually the, all of the stuff which most of our patients use for headache contains uh, camphor and eucalyptus. And it's an important unrecognized cause of essential oil induced medication overuse headache. So that's what the concept we uh, presented in Kefalagia reports that people not only should ask about NSAIDs, which are causing uh, or the tryptans or ergots, which cause medical medication overuse headache. You should also ask of all these complementary and alternative and over the counter medications, which contain stimulatory essential oils as a component of uh, uh, medication overuse headache. And maybe in your refractory, cluster headache patients, please check on all these things. And if you stop it, it can cause a significant improvement in your patient's headache frequency. And coming to the Patanjali Dantakanti, there's so many contents. And many times you have to do a detective research like Sherlock Holmes into Google and put this stuff and see what it contains. If you see the contents of Patanjali Dantakanti, you won't see eucalyptus and camphor. It will be written mentha spikate. And if you search mentha spikate and you see it contains polygon, it's an aromatic monotopene. And you see Salvadora persica, and this Salvadora persica is seen in many of these toothpaste. And if you check the, uh, the chemical component of Salvadora uh, persica, the chemical profile, you can see it contains two joints, which are GABA receptor blockers. And you have camphor and cineol, which uh, blocks the potassium channels and increases the calcium currents in the neurons. And these are the stuff which causes stimulation. And this causes, and this is present in most of these, um, you know, the toothpaste which are currently in market. And be careful with all these toothpaste in your epileptic migraine and cluster patients. And thank you for your patient listening. And if you see this slide of thank you, uh, be careful with the natural and uh, things, you know, you go and buy, don't go by that marketing strategy. Cocaine comes from leaves, camphor comes from leaf, cannabis comes from leaves, opium comes from leaves, and eucalyptus come from leaf. And you know the tobacco leaves also. And if you take the cluster headache, around 80%, 60 to 80 percentage of cluster people have smoking and they have found that in smokers with clusters and non-smokers with clusters. In smokers, the cluster headaches are more severe and tend to more chronify in smokers and maybe the tobacco. And if you find the, uh, the action of tobacco in cluster headache, they also stimulate the transient receptor potential, transient receptor potential uh, anchor in one receptor. The nicotine also stimulates the anchor in uh, one receptors and can cause us increased release of calcium gene related peptide. And so uh, both tobacco and this um, camphor eucalyptus are also important in uh, cluster patients. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas. For an excellent case. Uh, I think uh, as Dr. Ravi Shankar has said, we're uh, open to two questions. Sir, would you take up the questions? Yeah. So now there are no significant questions here, but uh, so let me ask uh, Dr. Thomas a question. Uh, 
Uh, that's an unusual case. So very interesting. Uh, there are a couple of things I would like to ask you, Thomas. I definitely appreciate your paper of eucalyptus and uh, rebound headache and migraine. Now, what we are dealing with here is a totally different type of headache. So, number one, uh, you will need to, your uh, treatment of the cluster headache in the first place was not truly to the maximal level. So, I would not call it still refractory at that stage. So, I would say it is suboptimal at that stage. The second point is you will be able to prove your point if during his next cycle or spells of cluster headache, he is not taking the dantakanti and he still gets the same type of attacks, then where do you go from there? Third is if he's still in the spell, would you like to re-challenge by introducing the dantakanti and see because your cause and effect relationship in a side locked headache with autonomic features does not appeal so easily. So your uh, message, your case is definitely interesting, but the message you're sending across may not be completely the right message. Would you like to uh, opine on re-challenging him with Dantakanti? Yeah, yeah, sir. It is a wonderful thing. And I think I should ask him in the next cluster headache, just take the Dantakanti. So it's a very interesting question. And uh, I would like to answer this question to whatever level of knowledge we have at this moment. Because when I presented this case report of Amrdanjan to this uh, Kefalalgia, you don't believe seven reviewers across the globe grilled me for almost one month. You know, it is not easy to present to Kefalalgia and tell that. No, that is, know, well taken. see, that is migraine, that is well taken. We are yeah, now, yeah. Cluster now, now, now you are back to cluster headache with all the same questions. So it will be tough for. I'm just writing okay. that paper now. Okay. I'm we just did. looking for the mechanisms of how cluster is, uh, you know, how the mechanism of cluster. So if you see, interestingly, for migraine and cluster, the CGRP is a very important molecule for migraine and cluster both. And even sumatriptan you give for cluster headache. So you give sumatriptan for the cluster headache. So mechanism wise, the trigeminal cervical complex, hypothalamus. And they're all very closely connected and CGRP is an important molecule which uh, you know, causes that. And if you see the you know, first paper on umbilillon causing the cluster headache, this was an elderly man around 60 plus. He used to have cluster headache when he was a young man for many years and he was cluster headache free. So in his garden, when he used to go, whenever he takes this California bay leaf and smell, he used to get the same cluster periods. So he himself rechallenged many times with the same leaves, and they found that the same thing produced the exact cluster headache previously he had. Uh, let us know so, what exactly happens to this man. We would yeah, be and I think that uh, somebody else also posted a question that uh, you know uh, it might be a, a, a spontaneous resolution of the cluster period. Yeah, that can be also a possibility. So yes. I think it's an interesting observation, and I think you need to go on to you know kind of do some more association to make Absolutely. it a more plausible cause. So can we go to the next case, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Very good. Next case, please. Uh, I think next is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shucharita. Yes, sir. Yeah. So Dr. Shujita, uh, she is uh, assistant professor uh, of neurology working at PGI Chandigarh. And uh, she is a very young, good neurologist. So she is going to talk about judging a headache from its cover. Sir, am I visible and audible both? Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all the esteemed panelists and uh, the audience. So uh, this is a quick case, but it's been worked up in detail. And uh, the title is Judging a Headache from its Cover. And I hope by the time I end, you will be able to understand why I have named it as such. So it speaks about a 34 year old uh, male I first saw in February of this year who did not have any comorbidities, complete teetotaler from Bihar. He had come to me with new onset headache for six months. Basically this person was referred from my neurosurgery colleague uh, for a second opinion. So he had holocranial non-throbbing, moderate intensity headache, mostly associated with heaviness of head. There was no nuchal pain, nausea, vomiting, photophonophobia, no visual symptoms of any sort. There was no hearing loss, any tinnitus, no imbalance or any other brainstem symptoms. He did not attribute any aggravating or relieving factors. And he did not have any history of rhinosinusitis, any chronic diseases or any such other conditions for which he could have taken medical treatment uh, prior. 
Now on examination, he was completely normal except for having bilateral papilledema with peripheral field restriction. There was no limitation of ocular mobility, uh, mobility and there was uh, on the field examination, there was enlargement of blind spot and the best corrected visual acuity was six by six. So this is his fundus. You can see the enlargement of blind spot along with the peripheral uh, restriction of fields. Apart from that, his complete general examination and neurological examination was completely normal. This is the MRI that he carried from, uh, from Bihar. So uh, this, you know, as you can see, you can see this very heterogeneous, hyper intense T2 weighted and even flare sequences with severe enhancement in the post contrast. Contrast enhancement is also pretty heterogeneous. So these are mostly multiple nodular in nature and they appear to be dural based. So the presence of CSF clefts can be clearly seen in them. And these lesions are associated with intervening CSF clefts along the fal cerebri, the tentorium cerebelli, and even along the rest of the uh, dural space. The final impression that he was carrying from Bihar was actually meningomatosis, neurofibromatosis, for which they had suggested him some operation and had referred him to Chandigarh. And my neurosurgery colleague was not very sure of, you know, the whole operative part, so he wanted me to take a closer look. Now, this man also carried MR spectroscopy, as you can see with the voxel placed uh, on one of the lesions near the tentrum cerebelli. We can see there is a choline creatinine uh, ratio of 2.83 with a choline peak. No associated peaks are there. We all know the differentials of choline peak 2, mostly being attributed to that of a high grade neoplasm like a glioma or multiple meds. Uh, it's a ratio of 2.83 that may not, you know, that usually uh, lies in somewhere around the borderline areas. So it can also indicate some sort of an infection or inflammation. So the diagnosis was not exactly delineated from uh, the pictures that he carried. So I carried out some investigations after examining him. This is the first set of general investigations uh, that we saw. You can see that the ESR was 20, which was almost normal. CRP was slightly raised. Uh, he had normal calcium. The hormonal profile was broadly normal. Non-diabetic person, renal kidney function tests were completely normal. The CSF showed 30 cells, mostly lymphocytic. Protein slightly elevated at 55. Sugars were normal. ADA was 3. And the entire infective workup was negative. So we did a CCT chest also in case of the nodular deposits and our differentials that we had kept. I'm uh, trying to show you the PET images, which are way more dramatic, and they also reveal the same information. So here you can see the topmost panel on the right. You can see this multiple uh, FDG avid lesions, bilateral palatine tonsils in both sides of the mediastinum, not so much of hyalur, but mediastinal nodes are present. They're seen in autocaval, uh, retro, uh, parapancreatic, retropancreatic, uh, paraortic lymph nodes. And these are FTG average to varying sizes. And the largest size was in the bilateral inguinal region of around 15 millimeters. What you can see in the brain is the same avid nodular meningeal thickening in the brain, which actually extended way down to C1. So the final diagnosis that was kept by uh, the NMR guys after looking at the MRI was actually lymphoma. And they also wanted to consider sarcoidosis and IgG4. So we had also lined up our further investigation reports by then. So amongst others, you will be surprised to know that uh, he had both a rise in the serum ACE levels at 91. The serum IgG4 levels were also raised at 168, higher limit being 140. There was no induration on MONTU and the C3 levels were raised. And his entire vasculatic profile, which I'll be discussing later as a differential, came out to be negative. So, you know, this radiological differentials uh, for a patient who presents with such nodular pachymeningeal involvement. Actually, a lot of causes have been given, but in our clinical practice, more or less the patients that we meet uh, usually belong to these four or five categories. That is, either they can have tuberculosis or IgG4 can be an important differential, sarcoid, uh, uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis or vaginous granulomatosis, and even cases of lymphoma. But does that radiological pattern actually follow this nodular deposits in all cases? So on the left side of the image, you can actually see this uniform pachymeningeal thickening, which was seen in a patient with granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This sign is actually called an Eiffel Tower at night sign because of the way the tentorium cerebelli and the file appear with contrast enhancement. Contrast is to our patient whose image has been given on the right. You can see broadly nodular deposits abutting the tentorium cerebelli and the lower portion of the file and not extending uniformly, although basal meninges as well as the rest of the file cerebri are affected to a 
different uh, to an extent, but it is actually less than before. So the most important differentials that we were considering for our patient based on the findings, the first possibility that we were actually considering was IgG4. And we were also considering lymphoma. Granulomatosis is always an option when we see pachymeningitis in our setup. Tuberculosis, it is endemic. It will be foolhardy for us not to consider that, even if the workup has been negative. And then finally, sarcoid was a diagnosis. For IgG4, I would like to pinpoint some important features which need to be uh, seen in order to be able to delineate the diagnosis because there is significant overlap. Most importantly, the ESR is usually raised in IgG4 patients. In our case, it was only 20. This is because of marked hypergamma globulinemia that is seen in the pathology of IgG4. Correspondingly, because it is a non-inflammatory process or a semi-inflammatory uh, chronic inflammation, the CRP levels are usually not elevated to that extent. A very significant finding of IgG4 is reduced complement levels, whereas in our patient, we had raised amount of complements, both C3 and C4, whereas in IgG4, they are usually reduced because of gross hypercomplementemia. Finally, the serum IgG4 levels need to be raised, but they differ from person to person. And the biopsy should have plasma cells with IgG4 and a palisading architecture in order to be able to suggest an IgG4 pathology. Why not a lymphoma? Now, he's a young male, but the lymphoma is with pachymeningeal nodular deposits, can have dural, uh, nodular thickening. They, they need to have a parenchymal component. Leptomeningeal infiltration needs to be seen. There should be CSF picture. In our patient, malignant cytology was negative repeatedly. Even the ocular examination was normal in our patient uh, for, the, for the vitreal part. And finally, again, the biopsy would be needed to make a diagnosis. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, the take-home messages would be that it occupies pachymeningeal involvement is way more than leptomeningeal involvement, but you need to have multiple cranial nerve pulses. And you also need to have other stigmata of vasculitis or mastoiditis in these patients. They can also present with thrombosis, which can be associated with pachymeningitis. And you need to look for necrotizing granulomas on biopsy. Not to mention pulmonary and renal involvement, which is seen to a huge extent in generalized granulomatosis polyangiitis. In our patient, uh, the active sediments are also uh, not there. And so also the Pianca Sienka, which was completely negative, both by immunofluorescence and ELISA. Finally, lymphadenopathy is not seen to that extent. And obviously, when you have uh, pachymeningitis, you might have an Eiffel Tower at night. Tuberculosis, endemic in India, it can have any sort of involvement. Radiological pattern can be variable. Everything can be variable, but you need to have some proof, either in terms of a TBPCR or a MONTO, or presence of biopsy showing necrotizing granulomatous lesion, AV positivity, some sort of a thing would be probably required to clinch the diagnosis. And finally, sarcoid, which in which the pachymeningitis is uh, uh, an important, but it's a rare presentation, need to have raised taste levels, cutaneous energy, as seen in our patient. Palatine tonsillar uptake has been described in sarcoid, but again, it is non-specific, can also be seen in lymphoma and tuberculosis. And biopsy needs to be that of non-necrotizing granulomas. Presence of cranial nerve pulse is again not seen in our patient, and responsiveness to steroid. So now one more minute. What, what actually clicks the diagnosis in our case was this biopsy. So this histopathology actually shows compact epithelial cell granulomas with multinucleated giant cells without any necrosis or mucocytoplastic vasculitis. There were no atypical cells. The IgG4 staining was negative. And so we concluded the final diagnosis to be sarcoid. It is interesting to know that these entities are not seen for the first time. They have been reported over the years under various headings like idiopathic tumefactive hypertrophic pachymeningitis way back in 2005-2007, where actually nodular thickening was, uh, was dis discussed as one of the differentials of idiopathic variety. And I would like uh, to change the opinion of the house and to bring to awareness for all my audience is that when we bring to notice these patterns, we should be very suspicious and we should carry on the investigations. Pachymeningitis due to sarcoid is not common, but it is reported. And in fact, we have case reports where hypertrophic pachymeningitis associated with sarcoid has also been seen with increased IgG4, as we have seen in our case. We worked with this assumption that the mediastinal and inguinal lymphadenopathy were actually from the same diagnosis as that of the meningeal component. And I'm pretty sure that they share the same pathology. We actually did not, uh, were not able to do the bulb washing uh, for the pulmonary, even if it was asymptomatic for the CD4, CD8 ratio to, because it's a highly specific marker for sarcoid because of the imposition of the lockdown. And I have been in touch with my patient. He has got complete regression of the papilledema. His headaches have gone ever since he's been started on steroids. Uh, he's 
awaiting a repeat interval imaging as soon as the lockdown is lifted in Bihar. So my take home message is that we must avoid labeling of idiopathic uh, variety of patients with pachymeningitis where the common and obvious causes are absent. And we need to meticulously work up and also follow up these patients. Second thing to keep in mind is that we should know that there is an overlap seen in granulomatosis with polyangiitis, IgG4 and sarcoid spectrum. And in a lot of patients, only it's the time that augurs the missing links to be established. And for the audience, let's not be afraid to change the diagnosis if the situation such arises because temporal evolution may occur over a period of time, which can clear the picture further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sucharita, for a nicely worked up case. Now, Dr. Ravi Shankar to take over, question answers. Yeah, that was a very well worked up case, uh, Sucharita. And if there are any questions from the audience, please uh, bring up the questions. We don't have anything in the chat box as yet. Uh, so what happened to the headache? As a headache specialist, I'm more interested in headache. So tell us that, how did the patient respond in terms of headache? The headache has completely disappeared. In fact, after one week of starting of steroids, it's completely vanished. And in fact, now he calls me and because I was tapering the doses, and now that he's been at 20 milligrams twice alone, he says the moment I go from 20 to 15, my headache recurs. So it's been four months. Unfortunately, they're locked up in Bihar. They can't even go for a repeat imaging. And a part of our workup is also left. So he's responded brilliantly. Not a single episode of headache in the last two months. Okay. So if there are no questions, we move to the next case, sir. Yes, we will. I, I think Sanjay is next case. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Prakash. He is the head of the Department of Neurology and a very known headache enthusiast, headache specialist uh, working in India. Uh, he has got a lot of publications. And uh, like uh, Thomas, who is uh, you know uh, very much interested in oil business, uh, Sanjay is very much interested in vitamin business. So Sanjay, please go ahead. Is it visible, sir? Light visible? Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. And after wonderful lecture on the chronic migraine therapy by Dr. Alok, now something uh, different here. It is just a case report, so not uh, in the term of uh, evidence-based medicine. Just few years back, we have reported uh, this case, chronic migraine responding to intravenous famine, a report of two cases. We have published this in a headache journal. And uh, it was published in 2016. And But after that, uh, we are regularly giving famine in a chronic migraine patient. And we found a uh, good result in many patients. And I will be presenting one of these cases. And after this, I will uh, try to give some hypothesis behind the response of this uh, famine in chronic migraine patients. A 32-year-old female having history of migraine for last 10 years, and but for last one year it was in chronic in nature, more than 50 days in a month, and it was progressively increasing in frequency, severity, and for last four to five months there was almost daily headache and there was episodic exacerbation. Exacerbation was just like a migraine, three to four episode in a week, present lasting for four to 24 hours. There was migraine in the form of nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia. Nausea and enoxia were persistent for last uh, six to eight weeks, almost on daily basis. And patient admitted to losing a three to four kg weight in last few months. On asking, he, he admitted to having dizziness, vertigo, imbalance, fatigue, and disturbed sleep. Preventive drug, according to patient, was largely ineffective in last few months, and abortive drug was also not effective. And he, he used to take paracetamol, naproxen, and other painkillers. When patient visited to our uh, casualty department, he, he was on one of the headache attacks that was going on for the last four to five days. It was moderate to severe, especially with nausea, vomiting, and there was a lot of other symptoms. When we examined the patient, we noted the mini mental exam examinations 26. There was impaired, uh, in, impairment was in the recall, and visual segment was impaired. We noted gauge evocation segments, intestinal tremor was there. We also noted positive heel skin test and tendon work, suggesting some cerebellar sticker. So we suspected a possibility of vernicase encephalopathy in patients with chronic migraine. And vernicase encephalopathy may occur due to uh, in episodic migraine due to recurrent nausea and vomiting. 
so suspecting but in case encephalopathy we started uh, thymine we first started in, uh, immediately and we suspect, suspected the patient for various investigation that include mri brain even thymine level was done mri brain was normal uh, but uh, thymine level was little bit on lower side so we started the uh, thymine in the dose of 500 mg intravenous over 60 minutes and we gave it three times per day and we noted a marked improvement in headache just in the 12 hours there was a marked improvement and it subsided completely in 24 hours cerebral sign and other cognitive impairment also improved and there was mms returned to normal on fifth day nystagmus was not there in one week duration we continued thymine for uh, in, in the intravenous form about uh, four days and after that we switched to oral therapy 100 mg bid for uh, next six weeks and we added flunazone as he still having had the history of the chronic migraine we followed this patient for uh, sev uh, after several weeks and months uh, several follow was there and there was uh, in first six weeks there was just one uh, three attack of the migraine and uh, patient was uh, very much satisfied occasional dizziness vertigo was there so we calculated that uh, we can treat intravenous thymine lead to improvement in both vernicus encephalopathy and associated headache so we suggested here that uh, we felt that thymine even may work in the headache so we reviewed the literature to to find out the interrelation between thymine and headache and we all know recurrent head migraine attack in the uh, with nausea and vomiting may be a risk factor in the vernicus encephalopathy that's what we suspected in, in this patient in the early stage so we further reviewed this condition and we noted that vernicus encephalopathy not vernicus encephalopathy subclinical thymine deficiency may cause frequent headache in the headache book in the icd it is not mentioned but subclinical thymine deficiency hello is it visible hello subclinical thymine deficiency may cause frequent headache and uh, this is this so slide is showing the various uh, study on the vernicus encephalopathy and you can see here nausea vomiting is quite common in vernicus encephalopathy and in some study it was almost universal more than 90% of cases so nausea vomiting is quite common in vernicus encephalopathy and moreover there is a term gastrointestinal very very they had nausea vomiting and abdominal complaint are a common feature in sub clinical thymine deficiency or we may say it is in maybe in the few patient is maybe the early stage of the vernicus encephalopathy so there is the interesting finding migraine causes headache nausea and vomiting and thymine causes again headache nausea vomiting and migraine causes thymine deficiency so we suspected the uh, uh, interrelation and we defined this interrelation uh, in this form migraine nausea vomiting and fever and this will cause thymine deficiency and thymine deficiency again especially in the mild form may cause nausea vomiting and headache so a vicious circle may form and uh, in one study we noted that persistent frequent nausea is associated with progression to chronic migraine so we suspect in such type of patient nausea persistent nausea may lead to uh, thymine deficiency and subclinical thymine deficiency may be the one of the reason in contributing the chronicity of the migraine patient here we can conclude with this uh, observation this is the diagnostic criteria of the vernicus encephalopathy there are for to diagnose vernicus encephalopathy we need uh, four groups and two out of four are required history suggestive of dietary deficiency oculomotor abnormality only nystagmus is sufficient enough some cerebellar sign should be there uh, altered mental state only two out of four are required to make a diagnosis of vernicus encephalopathy as far as dietary deficiency is concerned in migraine patient we know nausea and vomiting will be there but the most important thing here is that just i will read out this sentence because of the body's reserve of thymine are sufficient for up to 18 days in a healthy individual any condition of unbalanced nutrition that last 2 to 3 weeks may lead to vernicus encephalopathy so just 2 to 3 weeks of unbalanced nutrition may lead to vernicus encephalopathy means the mild form of thymine deficiency will be very common just with some unbalanced nutrition this slide is showing the different uh, uh, abnormality in the chronic migraine that may be considered as a overlap with vernicus encephalopathy cognitive impairment just like vernicus encephalopathy sub clinical cerebellar symptom sub clinical vestibular cerebellar symptom so there is some overlap in the 
सब क्लिनिकल थायमिन डेफिशिएंसी एंड क्रोनिक माइग्रेन एज फर सिम्टम कॉम्प्लेक्स आर कंसर्न एंड वी आल्सो ट्राई टू कंपेयर द हेलो वी आल्सो ट्राई टू कंपेयर द एमआरआई फाइंडिंग ऑफ द वर्निकेस विद द माइग्रेन इन माय वर्निकेस इन इन केफली प्रति पेरी एक्वेडक्टर ग्रे मैटर हेलमस is the common site in vernicke uh, encephalopathy and when we review the migraine chronic migraine patient again peri equidectal gray matter helmus is the site where uh, chronic migraine may have some abnormality just you can compare here this is the uh, on left side which is showing the vernicke encephalopathy abnormality helmus peri equidectal gray matter and same thing in the migraine patient in the same area so there is some in the, uh, overlap even in the area involvement in the then so we suggest that thymine may act on migraine on pain nights so it may potentiate or it may aggravate the frequency or severity so we suggest that in chronic migraine patient few headache attack and many other associated features may be related to thymine deficiency and the circle and just administration of a thymine may break that circle and there may be improvement so just we conclude that migraine may lead to deficiency of thymine and thymine deficiency may lead to migraine like headache and other associated features and in vicious circle may be formed here just thymine supplementation may break the cycle and thymine probably act on somewhere in the migraine or pain network thank, thank you. you thank you sanjay for a very nice and lucid presentation and uh, raising a you know a possibility that uh, vitamins might be involved especially thymine may be involved we all know about uh, especially the riboflavin magnesium coenzyme q and now you are uh, suggesting a possible role of uh, thiamine sir dr ravi shankar please uh, i think both uh, thomas and sanjay have uh, given us food for thought so we need to think uh, differently in uh, these situations so now uh, since there are no other questions from the audience we uh sir can i ask one question to sanjay yeah yeah sure yeah yeah sanjay few of our colleagues believe vitamin b12 also gets uh, you know uh, some link to migraine and few of our colleagues they say where they take one shot of b12 once in 2 uh, 3 months and they feel their migraines comes down so do you think b12 also has something to do with uh, migraine similar to your thiamine and riboflavin and things like that maybe maybe if, if your colleague is receiving only b12 then it is okay otherwise what happen many time this b12 uh, injection also have thymine i mean okay that, that may be true yeah that injection can then and and, and it is a practice that in many patients we supplement little b12 and thymine after your talks yeah. you know we give that also and, and sometimes it helps but recently i had a patient who told he gets headache when he takes that b12 and thymine tablets he told then i stopped so i don't know <laughs> Okay, Thank so you. we move to the next case. Uh, that is by Dr. Ashish Dugal. Yeah. And Dr. Know, Ashish know, Dugal is the associate professor of neurology at uh, Jibhi Pant Hospital, New Delhi. So, Dr. Ashish, kindly uh, share your screen and start with the case. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi, for the opportunity to present this case and. Uh, the screen is visible i suppose not as yet not it not yet not yet yeah. okay yes yeah. okay so this is a case of a young girl 8 uh, year old girl with headache and seizure and so the cause of seizure looked quite apparent on imaging but there was you more to it screen screen show you got a screen show Um, you can do full screen. Okay, screen, okay, screen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Slide show, Sorry. slide show, slide show. Is it visible now? Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, although the uh, cause of seizure looked quite uh, apparent on the imaging, but there was much more to it what, than what the eyes actually saw. So, this was a young girl, eight year old. She presented with history of repeated seizures. The symptomology was that uh, there was an aura with a sense of uneasiness, followed by a headache, which was usually bifrontal, followed and that was followed by chronic movements to the left half of face and turning of head and eyes to the left side, and uh, chronic movements of the left upper and lower lip with tongue bite, incontinence, and repeated vomiting. 
The first of the such seizures lasted for about 30 minutes, and she was vomiting throughout the seizure. After the seizure, she had continuous headache, which lasted for about three hours after the seizure. There was no history of any diminution of uh, or blurring of vision or double vision. There was no history of any focal neurological deficits, no history of fever, neck pain, or abdominal pain, and birth and development history was unremarkable. For these complaints, she was seen in a private hospital where the CT showed a calcified granuloma with perilegional edema. So it was thought that this is the cause of these focal seizures, and she was started on carbamazepine, and then she was discharged from there. She was seizure-free for some days, but again she has started having seizures after a period of around seven days. So the seizure duration decreased, and also the vomiting decreased. And after that, for these reports, referred to our institute, and. The, we continued our CBZ. We built up the dose, uh, thinking that probably the dose is inadequate and the seizures will remit as the seizure, uh, dose uh, becomes adequate. But in spite of that, she continued to have frequent. And during some of the episodes, she also had form visual aura in the form of cartoon characters. And in view of frequent seizures, she was admitted for further evaluation. At the time, there was no uh, neurological disease. Uh, her vital parameters were all normal. The blood pressure was 90 by 60. And we thought that these were focal aware seizures with autonomic features, a secondary occipital lobe epilepsy with autonomic symptoms, causing occip uh, cause was occipital lobe calcification, probably a healed neurocystis sarcosis. We increased the CBZ levels, uh, CBZ dose, and added clobazam. Although the frequency of seizures decreased, she started complaining of severe epi several episodes of severe bifrontal and bitemporal bursting headaches per day that would last for 30 to 45 minutes. And was associated with vomiting in which these headaches were occur in between the seizures. And there, besides these headaches, uh, severe headaches, there was mild persistent background pain was also persistent. Uh, routine investigations which we did showed that the CRP was positive. You know, sodium was low, probably because of uh, carbamazepine. And the rest of the investigations, uh, routine investigations, turned out to be normal. So we changed carbamazepine to Valprat in view of the hypolatremia. She did not further seizures, but the headaches were persisting. So we got an MRI done, which revealed that there was T2 flare hyperintensities in the periventricular white matter, subcortical, subcortical, in the basal ganglia, and most importantly, in the in the medullary area, there was significant T2 flare hyperintensity in the medulla and the pons. Besides, there was also a calcified granuloma in the left occipital lobe. The radiologist gave an impression of a possible edem. He also did an EG, which was intraocular, and it was normal. So we thought that probably we are dealing with some sort of autoimmune encephalitis, and the calcified granuloma was, and other possibilities we kept was MOG associated encephalomyelitis or an equiparin four positive of the significant medullary lesions. So we further investigated it further. But during the stay of admission, the fourth day, uh, that is around second day after the MRI was done, she had acute onset severe headache that peaked in around less than one minute, and this was followed by one episode of seizure. We added lecosamide for continued seizure with seizure. She, however, continued to have severe unocranial bursting headache along with vomiting and pain abdomen. At this time, her BP was recorded to be 130 by 90, and pulse was 116 per minute, which was quite high for her age. So, repeated blood pressure measurements were done then, and we found that this was persistently high, up to 186 by 120 millimeters mercury, with tachycardia in the range of 140 to 150 per minute. Continue to head, have severe headaches, would keep on crying because of the headaches, and was quite restless. Our seizures had not recurred. She had only one more episode of seven days. So, in view of persistent hypertension, we started her on amlodipine and levetiracetam infusion. But the BP decreased, but did not come to normal, in spite of maximum doses of levetiracetam. So, considering that probably some central thing is at play here, we started her on clonidine. And with the addition of clonidine, BP normalized. The headache and tachycardia then improved. Further investigation for the cause of hypertension revealed that the cortisol and uh, and similarly the 24 hour artery BMA was normal. However, there was left renal artery stenosis was present. The autoimmune encephalitis panel and the MOG and equiparin 4 antibodies also came out to be negative. 
and uh, the mri was repeated around 8 to 10 days 8 days after the, the severe thunderclap headache and this showed that uh, there was a significant improvement in the white matter in the pons and the, the subcortical white matter they had decreased quite significantly as compared to the previous mri and fine was also done thinking that uh, probably there could be a lesion here to look for extracorporeal pons or morgan cephalitis in view of that but this again was completely common so there was marked improvement in the imaging findings and there were only a few hyperdense lesions in the bilateral periventricular matter and the white matter in the central semiosphere so uh, in view of the renal artery stenosis we did a ct angio of the aorta and we found that there was a stenosis of the renal artery around 70 to 80% short stenosis of the right subclavian artery was seen the left renal artery stenosis and we also did a repeat mri and mr angio after around 3 days of the uh, initial and the mri had been resolved almost completely and the mri did not reveal any abnormalities so there was no evidence of any rcbs there we did a ct chest the astral lymphadenopathy it was contrast and anything and uh, it was reported as probably infective so we thought that this is probably related to tuberculosis and this tuberculosis was uh, associated to arthritis so to summarize this young girl had recurrent seizures which were focal aware seizures with visual aura stenosis headache which was related to probably the occipital lobe granuloma then she developed persistent severe recurrent headaches vomiting and finally developed a severe thunderclap headache associated with palpitations and vomiting which was followed by a persistent headache so uh, we believe uh, that there were three types of headaches in this uh, young girl first was headache attributed to the epileptic seizure so there was an ectal headache associated with a partial seizure and a post ectal headache then probably the second headache which the persistent had uh, several episodes occurred with a background pain was probably at the headache attributed to secondary anxiety of the central nervous system takayasu arthritis finally when she developed acute hypertensive crisis without encephalopathy uh, along with the thunderclap headache so that was headache which was attributed to hypertensive crisis without any encephalopathy so uh, in view of the positive cr traffic abnormalities and young age we takaya to arthritis so the other possibility was fibromuscular dysplasia but that was not there because of uh, the involvement of the subclavian artery and the age of the patient so well, the final diagnosis that we made was pulmonary cox with taca and press with central and brain stem lesion and the exaggerated hypertension was probably due to barrow reflex failure occurring as a result of medullary lesions in the uh, involvement of the nucleus of tractus collaterius after the mri improved and the headache side uh, subsided we gradually stopped clonidine and she was made on 15 mg bd she did not have any headaches and no further seizures and uh, we continued her on att and steroids and renal revascularization plan briefly i would just discuss that takaya to associated with press this was the case series uh, most of the patients were young in the age of 9 to 12 or 20 years of age and uh, the most of them presented with headaches and seizures just like our case so uh, and the crp was raised and the reason for this uh, acute hypertensive crisis which occurred the stay is probably occurred because nucleus of tractus collaterius in the medulla which led to an increased sympathetic output leading to increased arterial blood pressure and increased heart rate and these uh, causes would be uh, in any and we involving such as syringobulbia infarction and cephalic syndrome can be responsible for a barrow reflex failure causing an acute hypertensive crisis so how we postulate uh, the scheme uh, of events in this case uh, there was takayasu arthritis leading to some baseline renovascular hypertension which predisposed the patient to press and uh, probably the occipital lobe seizures occurring as a result of the calcified granuloma caused some autonomic uh, hyperactivity and increased the blood pressure which leads to led to 
spread in uh, already set, uh, setting of Akayasu arthritis and caused a baroreflex failure because of the neglect of tractor solitaries involvement and that led to an acute hypertension crisis. She was associated with an abrupt rise in BP with tachycardia, which did not improve in spite of maximum doses of albulotipine and lebetalog, but improved with a central agent such as fluoridine. So finally, the take-home message here is that imaging findings may not be always responsible for the entire spectrum of as was evident here, and pressure should always be checked even in the pediatric population. And Takayasu arthritis can be a cause of stress. So in young patients, one should always look for uh, any uh, unequal pulses or variation in blood pressures on either side. And medullary lesions of various etiologies can cause baroreflex failure and marked hypertension with and the acute hypertensive crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashish, for a very nice uh, worked up case. Dr. Ravi Shankar, please. Thank you. That was a very well worked up case and uh, you have tied up the clinical presentation with your findings very nicely. And uh, I think that is the closest uh, that we can get to explanation of uh, the three different types of findings that you had. And uh, the hypertensive crisis also you have put it in place. So glad that she's doing, uh, she's under control and she's doing well now. So if there are any questions from the audience, we would be happy to ask the questions. You've proven most of the points. So are there any questions that the audience wants to ask? So one question was this, uh, Divya uh, Shilpa, this was a diagnosis of TB proven by tissue diagnosis, Ashish. No, we did not do a tissue diagnosis. Even uh, it's been around four to five months when the patient came, we advised renal revascularization, but the attendants was, they felt that she is doing much better now and they have not yet gone for renal revascularization even. And another question, was the CSF study done? Yeah, CSF was done, I think probably missed it, but the CSF was essentially normal. Okay. And uh, in, in, in reference to the previous case, Dr. Nirmal Shurya says that in his study of B12 deficiency, 40% patients had headache, so just a passing. So thank you, thank you, Ashish. Uh, if there is any panelist who wants to ask anything. Ashish, uh, to uh, two Dr. things, Ashish. Ashish. One is that granuloma may be incidental, you know. Sometimes what yeah, happens, if you have a seizure, you get some edema around the granuloma, that, that the calcific granuloma may be incidental sitting there. So, yeah, that could be incidental. That, that's actually the crux of the case that probably it was an incidental finding. It was seizures and then precipitated an event. And this tuberculosis, where it was? In the lungs or where you found the tuberculosis? It was, uh, there was mediastinal lymph node with enhancing mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, so we no don't biopsy know. was done. Maybe everything tachyasus only, what do you say? Everything may be just tachyasus. Yes, I think. It could be, it could be. Because yeah. the Takasus is known to be associated with tuberculosis, so that might be an additional finding. Yeah. But yeah. Of course, he cannot prove it because he has not done any tissue biopsy. Yes. So that's just a yeah. hunch or association. Case. And yeah. the secondary, yeah, the patient improved on ADT and steroids. Yeah. yeah, so that's the thing. Thank okay. you. So we go, yes, go to the next case uh, by uh, Dr. Sanjeev Bhoi. He is the professor of neurology at uh, Ames Bhubaneswar. Uh, he is going to present a very interesting case of uh, trigeminal neuralgia versus trigeminal neuropathy. Dr. Sanjeev, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Sanjeev, uh, Sanjeev just sharing sharing the screen. loudly, right? Yes. Loudly. Going to stop sharing the screen. We can't see you. Yes. Ashish, Ashish, you have to stop sharing your screen. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I don't know what this is. I don't know. I'm not sharing it right now. I don't think I will leave and join again. I don't know. It's not stopping. No, no, no. Yeah, it's only a slide. We can see your slide, uh, doctor. Just go to slideshow. Just go to that yes. slideshow. Sanjeev, you can go to size so, slideshow. So are you able to sir, see my slides? Yes. 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 Thank you, sir. Sir, respected teachers, the organizer of this headache subsection, my seniors and friends, so today I'll be discussing something atypical because all the discussions were on the headache, migraine, and the atypical migraine. But today I will discuss the facial pain that is the trigeminal neuralgia. Coming to my case, this is a 10-year child who presented to us with right-sided cheek pain. 
the pain was the character of the pain was very severe the pain intensity it was intermittent episodic lanceating like a throbbing like a piercing pain that aggravated with chewing and the episodes were multiple per day around 30 to 40 per day that last for few seconds less than a minute it was the child do some trick maneuver by rubbing the cheek the pain subsides for few seconds hello are you able to hear sir hello yes yes go ahead yes, okay so the pain was so severe that he was not able to attend the school from last 6 month so and while asking that at night also sometimes the pain aggravate and he wakes up from the sleep so he was diagnosed outside as a case of functional pain and he has given some help for it but without any response so coming to us with we examine the child there was no significant pain past or family history he has normal attended the milestone of development presently is in standard fifth the vitals were stable there is no signs of neurocutaneous marker the general and systemic exams were within normal limit and examination of the nervous system the cranial nerves especially were normal the lower cranial nerves also normal and outside eeg was reported as normal we also reviewed the eeg paper so the possibility of this child was a pain of facial pain this young child 10 years so whether it was a tribunal neuralgia okay it's fitting to the clinical criteria of tribunal neuralgia so whether it will be idiopathic or the classical variety or a secondary variety of tribunal neuralgia so second question was does it occurs in children because all the what we have studied is that the tn or the tribunal neuralgia occurs in adult population and more more common in the female so we have subjected the child to the imaging so in the imaging what we saw the t2 weighted imaging so a showing the arrow is showing the area of the cp angle the cerebral pontine angle showing a hyper intense lesion around the root entry zone of the tribunal nerve the lesion is hyper intense in the t1 weighted also so coming to the differential of a t2 and t1 hyper intense lesion maybe it may be epidermoid cyst or a lipid containing tumor so coming further to the other imaging sequences the imaging in the fat set image the t1 weighted the lesion is completely suppressible so there is probably it was a fat containing tumor and there is no diffusion restriction so lack of diffusion restrictions that is rule out the epidermoid so coming to the other special sequence in case of tribunal neuralgia the th the heavily tattooed images the fiesta or the 3d cs that show the nerve the the lipoma is averting the root entry zone of the tribunal nerve so as in the right side the left side is normal here the in fiesta sequence the csa will be more bright so you can see here the black part is the nerve averting at the level of the lipoma he has brought with a ct scan which is also suppressed the fat part is suppressed in the plain ct scan so with this background we have diagnosed a case of tribunal neuralgia in this young child probably it's a case of secondary tribunal neuralgia we have offered him the medication the medical management the 50 mg of carvangipine thrice daily the conventional drugs so with this treatment the pain intensity the throbbing the piercing pain reduced to 90% and at the 5 months recent follow up he was better and he is able to continue study so recently this image was this case report was accepted in the journal of pediatrics in this current issue so briefly i will discuss what is tribunal neuralgia and what is neuropathy for the resident so one of the our celebrity the famous celebrity salman khan is was suffering from this disease and it was a lament term the suicide disease because many person commit suicide because of this severe morbidity of the pain and there is no biomarkers to diagnose tribunal neuralgia so dr mr salman khan has undergone the surgery and he is doing fine now so coming to the anatomy there are three major branches the ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular branches of tribunal nerve so the supply above the forehead is the ophthalmic around the below the eye and the above the cheek is the vitreo division and third is the vitreo division where is the sensory part extend from the brain stem to the upper cervical column so coming to the history it was ancient age from 11th century it was known by avicenna but john fothergill first reported the symptoms of tribunal neuralgia in 1773 in the london paper the incidence is 12 per 100000 people the female is the predominant 1.74 to 1 and usually occurs in more than 50 years age but however in our ancient literature we could found the evidence of tribunal neuralgia in susruta and charaka samhita so how to describe the character of the pain it's abrupt onset short duration so these are very short lasting headache pain in the facial not headache the facial pain shock like and usually distributed in the v2 or v3 division so any of the nerves are distribution is affected v1 v2 v3 but v2 and v3 are most common around 30 to 35% each but the combination of v2 and v3 is predominant around 65 to 66% isolated v1 is very rare less than 5% i will talk on isolated v1 
and suppose contiguous nerve v1 v2 they will have the continuously either v1 v2 or v2 v3 not like v1 or v3 skipping the v2 so unilateral is the most common and we don't know why the right side is more affected in two third of patient and bilateral is very less less than 5% and think of secondary causes of trigeminal neuralgia coming to the triggers triggers are the very important part of the trigeminal neuralgia diagnosis so swing of the foot touching brushing of the teeth eating talking or cold wind can trigger the trigeminal neuralgia symptoms coming to the trigger zone trigger is separate thing in the trigger zones are trained in around 90% patients of trigeminal neuralgia without trigger zone it difficult to diagnose a case of trigeminal neuralgia so we have to meticulously ask the trigger zone and the commonly the tactile and vibration sense are the most common triggering factor so coming to the essentials for trigeminal historically the trigger zone second is the refractory period this should not be a continuous pain one variety of trigeminal neuralgia there will be mild to moderate pain on top of that there will have lancinating pain so to diagnose the lancinating the idiopathic variety the patient should have a refractory period second is the absence of sensory deficit the clinical general exam should be normal but however on meticulous examination of the sensory system like the quantitative sensory testing will give some around 30% of sensory loss so coming to the there is no definite pathophysiology but the most accepted are the focal demyelination and there is a proximal there is aphatic transmission due to this focal demyelination at the level of the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve so coming to the diagnostic criteria earlier it was followed by in 1969 by the white and sweet criteria the same criteria three criteria in 2018 the white and sweet criteria is very simple the pain is proximal pain may be provoked by light touches around the trigger zones pain may be con confined to the trigeminal distribution of the nerves pain is unilateral strictly and there should not be any clinical sensory loss however the icsd says the same like three attacks unilateral pain with criteria b to c the b is what occurring in one or more division either v1 v2 v3 most commonly v2 v3 and it should not radiate beyond the trigeminal nerve distribution pain has at least three of the following characteristics either it is a paroxysmal the duration is second to minute less than 2 minutes it should be severe in intensity shock like shooting like pain and there should be some trigger factor and trigger zones and there should not be any other evidence of uh, diagnosis so coming this slide says that how to approach a case of facial pain suppose the patient comes with a facial pain whether we are dealing with a trigeminal neuralgia or atypical facial pain if the pain is episodic paroxysmal so probably we are di diagnosing a case of possible trigeminal neuralgia okay next from possible you have to go to whether it is established or not if there is a trigger factor uh, you can trigger the patient is some trigger maneuver had treated the pain more then it is a clinically established trigeminal neuralgia so once diagnosing as a established trigeminal neuralgia now we have to narrow down the diagnosis whether it is idiopathic or a classical variety or a secondary variety idiopathic is there should not be any abnormality so there should not be any neurovascular conflict is idiopathic it is around 30 to less than 30% whereas classical trigeminal neuralgia is trigeminal neuralgia symptoms with a neurovascular conflict train at the root entry zone that is called the classical and what is the secondary if there is no if the if you get in the imaging wise there is other uh, other etiology like there is demyelinating flex there is tumor or the thickening of the other nerves then it is a case of secondary trigeminal neuralgia so coming to the this is the literature images here on the right side you can see there is a neurovascular conflict at the, around the root entry zone the black one is the vessels whereas the white one is the nerve on the left side you can see the nerve is well well seen and here the, the lower panel you can see the neurovascular bundle is compressing the root entry zone and displacing the nerve so mere presence of neurovascular because anyhow there will be vessel in that area so mere presence does not say whether that is producing the symptoms so neurovascular bundle has high sensitivity but very poor specificity so how to increase the specificity so if the nerve is dislocated dislodged yes, the flattening of the nerve one minute to go yes sir a flattening of the nerves or there is atrophy then it will have high chance to get a symptom so these are the red flag you are getting any sensory loss motor weakness any dysautonomic symptoms then you can say it's a secondary cause so what is the trigeminal sensory neuropathy the, the it is a very atypical form sometimes it's called benign also so the patient will have sensory loss with severe pain but there is no other motor finding or anything in the imaging so the patient behave like benign cause but usually this thing is a diagnosis of exclusion so these are the differential diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia you can with this and coming to the difference between trigeminal neuralgia versus neuropathy the same is the proximal event but here you will have continuous pain the pain will be burning pins and needle in neuropathy there should be clinical sensory loss allodynia is present in neuropathy but not in case of neuralgia and large area of allodynia will be present in case of neuropathy and cold hyperalgesia and these are the etiology of the neuropathy
So treatment is the same medical treatment and surgical. First line is the carbamazepine, second is the baclofen lamotrigine, others are the pain modifying drugs. But surgery, either you have to destroy the nerve partially or there is non destructive. So surgical is the microvascular decompression can be offered. So to conclude, sagittal neurology is a clinical diagnosis. There is no biomarker. MRI, you have to go for additional sequence like the T2 weighted, heavily weighted image, the MRI angiography, top image, or sometimes contrast, and to rule out the secondary causes. Only mere presence of neurovascular conflict is not. You have to look for the changes in the nerves. Medical management is the first line, carbamazepine. 70% patient gets pain relief. Surgery for intolerance, if, if you have tried multiple drugs, two or three, and patient is having side effects, young patient with comorbidity, and because of the work pressure loss, you can go for microvascular decompression. Isolated V1, TN, rule out other facilities like cluster, tongue, sunna, and children, secondary TN is the usual utility. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, Devashish. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sanjeev, for a nice uh, illustration of how to differentiate between these two common conditions. Uh, in children, it is unusual, so therefore, high index of suspicions must be maintained. Any questions, sir? Sir, you can take it over. There is one question which is uh, fairly uh, interesting. The question is, can we call it, this is, I'm not getting my chat. Uh, yeah, this is from uh, Dr. Pooja Kiran. Can we call it uh, trigeminal neuralgia if you have a secondary cause, but you yes, don't sir. have a sensory loss, I presume? There is uh, no sensory loss, or I don't know if what she wants is with a sensory loss. So she wants to know with a secondary cause, can you call it still trigeminal neuralgia? Yes, sir. In this patient, there was no sensory loss. So we can, with this character of the pain, it is a case of trigeminal neuralgia. But the, it comes into the group of secondary trigeminal neuralgia, not the idiopathic or the classical variant. And the reverse, can you have sensory loss without anything seen yes, on sir. the MRI? Yes, sir. Uh, to suggest patient may have sensory loss, but they are very, they do not usually complain of sensory loss. With the QST, you can get some 30% sensory loss, quantitative sensory loss. Okay. Any other questions? So we go to the last case of the se uh, this session. Uh, Dr. Nirendra Rai from uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal, is going to present an interesting case uh, with a different, different or unusual etiology of headache. Uh, I think that's a acute headache or a thunderclap headache kind of a headache. Dr. Niren. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to everyone. And I would like to express my sincere thanks to Devasi, sir, and uh, I am to giving me this opportunity. And this is a pure clinical case. Uh, uh, and we are going to discuss how we reach to the diagnosis. Uh, whether my screen is visible. Yes. Yes, yes. You you do the slideshow. Yeah. Put it on the slideshow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm doing. So uh, <laughs> I would like to express my uh, thanks to my senior resident, uh, Dr. Nikhil, who worked hard to make this uh, uh, diagnosis. This present, she is a 21-year-old girl presented with four episodes of severe holocranial headache in last two days only. So first day she was admitted, uh, managed in private hospital and next day she came to us. It was, onset was bilateral occipital reason and severe. And, uh, and used to reach within uh, peak intensity within few minutes of onset. And it would last for one to two hours. Associated with photophobia, phonophobia and nausea, but no vomiting or no features of trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. And she preferred to sit down or lie down during the attack. And uh, she would be as asymptomatic between the episodes. Uh, uh, important negative history, we could not find anything significant other than this uh, episodic thunderclap-like uh, brief short-lasting headache of non-local uh, lateralizing. Otherwise, uh, rest all the fever, no, no other secondary cause uh, we could get in the history. Uh, significant family history was that sis elder sister was having history of migraine, but uh, rest of the things were non-contributory. One important past history was that at the age of probably three years of the age, her parents noticed that she, was have, uh, she developed right upper limb weakness with mild slurring in the speech, which was persistent after a slowly, uh, slight improvement and then became static. But family members were not able to say uh, sure about how it started. 
So they were not able to say it was sudden onset or acute onset or anything about that. And they noticed at the age of three years. Her milestone, rest of the milestones, she started walking at the age of one year and her speech was normal till the three, about three years of the age. So till three years, she achieved her milestones normally. So important points in our patient was that uh, new onset short lasting episodic severe headache uh, with without any lateralization or any features of uh, attack, no temporal association with any other recent illness and past history of childhood onset hemiparesis with residual deficit. So uh, when she came, so we were thinking how we should proceed with this, uh, whether this uh, is a Past history of childhood onset hemiparesis is significant. It is a, ha having any contributory role or associated with this headache, or it is a and only a mere association of that, and whether it is primary or secondary headache, or it is a which kind of headache. So we just uh, tried to enumerate the few things, and uh, definitely it was thunderclap headache. So primary thunderclap headache may be there, and uh, one classification was found, uh, present in. Uh, ICSD 2B2, that was a uh, headache due to benign or reversible angiopathy of CNS, but this uh, in ICSD 3, it is probably removed. I could not find it. And then in secondary causes, so primary versus secondary and secondary causes, uh, our patient has recurrent headache. So we tried to see the recurrent headache, how many causes of thunderclap headache may be recurrent uh, like that, then colloidal cyst may of third ventricle may present like this. CSF hypotension, but it should be not, it would not like uh, within minutes it will peak, it will take some time and it will be postural dependent. Uh, headache related to AVM may be there and uh, in the background of uh, uh, childhood stroke, we considered Moya Moya syndrome may be another possibility. Um, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is the definitely the first, I would like to keep the first diagnosis in this scenario. And CNS anxiety, primary versus secondary, mitochondrial disease leading to a stroke and now recurrent headache. So all these were causes of recurrent headache and uh, um, uh, other cluster uh, thunderclap headache, we know that is uh, hemorrhage, SAH, uh, aneurysm and uh, arterial dissection, pituitary apoplexy. So keeping these possibilities, we try to um, get the answer, but uh, I must say imaging is the most important. So these are the some, uh, we know all the things I'm not going to discuss and these things, but primary thunderclap headache, mainly uh, reached to uh, in maximum intensity in one minute. But one thing is written that it is a very rare. So whenever we are thinking primary thunderclap headache, we, root, uh, we must rule out secondary, secondary causes. So keeping these possibilities, uh, clinically, I would like to say that uh, MRI is, uh, imaging is the most important thing in, if we are getting these kinds of headache. It will, uh, having very good exclusion uh, rate and many of the secondary causes may be ruled out with imaging. So, and uh, as a stroke was there, so we searched the literature also, and Moya Moya is also presented uh, in a uh, number of 55 percent, significant 50 percent of patients with Moya Moya disease may have headache uh, later on. And uh, another uh, childhood onset stroke with headache, we searched up to the 55 percent of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia may have headache. So keeping these possible clinical possibilities, bedside discussion uh, we discussed, and then we try to investigate. So other investigations, uh, cognitive functions were perfectly normal. Other than uh, one uh, uh, right side hemiparesis with uh, mild facial paresis with mild hemiparesis and uh, speech abnormality was uh, there. Other uh, rest of the other examinations, including fundus examination, urine, blood investigation, including ESR and CRP, CSF examinations, and X-ray chest and ultrasound abdomen, uh, renal doctor, everything was normal. MRI, that was uh, that is really important in all these kinds of headache, uh, revealed chronic infarct in bilateral corona radiator. With a, and posterior left posterior internal capsule with no abnormality detected on diffusion weighted MRI or SWI sequence. So probably it was uh, sequelae of old disease and uh, angiography and MR venography all were normal. Angiography we searched for any beaded appearance or any narrow, focal narrowing, but it was not there. Catheter angiography we could not do at that time. So patient's course during hospital stay was uh, she uh, uh, every day she was having two to three, uh, one to two episodes, each lasting same character, one to two hours. And uh, it was unresponsive to oral uh, NSAID or opioid, but partially relieved by IV ketorolac. Uh, the frequency and severity, uh, and during ep episode also, there was cognition was normal and no new neurological deficit we could find during the uh, attack also. So uh, her, uh, then we started oral nevodepin considering that, uh, ruling out the major secondary causes. So considering uh, probably, uh, RCVS, 
we give pneumonia, uh, oral pneumodipine. IV we, uh, intraarterial was not needed because there is no emergency, no uh, such a neurological deficit. So oral was started, and she had partial response. So we sent few investigations, including uh, uh, vasculitic profiles and uh, other uh, investigations, and we discharged her and uh, asked her to con contact after one week. Um, little bit word about uh, uh, cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is that usually median duration is five hours, um, uh, but uh, but it may last up uh, may last in five minutes to thirty uh, duration may be up to five minutes to thirty six hours peak uh, attains peak within one minute and frequency is variable may have one per day to uh, four to five and uh, one month. Uh, CT and uh, MRI usually should be abnormal. But it is reported uh, to be normal in even up to 50 to 20 percent uh, patients. So another possibility, uh, when when we are talking of reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, there is a probable reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So when if we are getting MRI uh, vascular stenosis in MRI or uh, imaging vascular imaging, we say uh, definite. And when we are not getting, then the word is probable. So our patient was fulfilling the criteria of probably probable un until we were not having any. Uh, the vasculitic investigation. So we were happy and we uh, discharged her. And then after one week, there was no improvement in headache. And uh, despite taking good uh, compliance to nemotipine, uh, it was uh, probably given 60 milligram every four to six hours, but there was no response. And then ANA and NTSS and, uh, A level was moderately elevated and CNK was highly elevated. So we were again confused. Now, it is a vasculitis. It is primary, uh, then it is a primary CNS vascular uh, anxieties or secondary CNS anxieties. So we re readmitted and re-evaluated. We repeated the CSF again, but it was again normal. Schremer's test was normal. Endoscopic evaluation of upper respiratory tract by ENT surgeon was unremarkable. And uh, no other systemic features we could find uh, uh, suggestive of any systemic and, uh, anxieties. Repeat, we again repeated MRI angiography and MRI vessel wall imaging as well as CT angiography, but everything was unremarkable. CCT thorax revealed patch, uh, patchy ground glass opacity in uh, left lower lobe of the liver. So, uh, so it was asymmetrical unilateral. So again, it was radiologists. We discussed with radiologists. They said it may be uh, immune mediated. It may be infective also. So they were not very sure about. Uh, they could not rule out, but uh, that it is uh, purely immune mediated. However, uh, for infective cause, uh, we could, uh, there was no predisposing factors. He was conscious, no chance of aspiration or anything. And counts and DSR, everything were normal. Ultimately, we, considering those uh, autoimmune factors, we started IV steroid and her headache subsided by, uh, by fourth day of the steroid therapy. And then we, uh, we uh, considering the long-term therapy and young uh, girl, we started azathioprine uh, along with the tapering, tapering dose of oral steroid. And uh, after, um, after telephonic conversation, we found that there is no headache. And she, again, she was called before this presentation. And she is uh, absolutely normal and no headache for last six months. So uh, again, the problem with our diagnosis is that uh, usually in CNS anxieties, CSF should be abnormal. 80 to 90 percent patients are having abnormal CSF in the form of mild uh, lymph uh, lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis and mildly increased protein. Our patient twice CSF was done was normal. Um, but what was favoring was that headache was uh, responsive to steroid. Uh, other we tried uh, other all uh, other things also there was no response. But after steroid, temporarily associated with st steroid responsiveness, and lung was having a lesion. And when follow up, we repeat the uh, repeated the X-ray, which was normal. Uh, so this was the, also a question: ki whether if it is RCVS steroid can help in uh, RCVS? Then we found that such the literature also and it suggested that glucocorticoid associated worsening of RCVS. So uh, this was also uh, uh, we tried to exclude, uh, exclude that it may be less likely to be RCVS, although it is difficult to say. Whether it is a uh, uh, antigen, in, uh, what we found CNK and ANA positive is a, uh, only asymptomatic positivity, but a strongly positive uh, um, CNK again suggested that probably it is a secondary central clap headache. So we, our final diagnosis we kept as a CNS anxiety probably secondary to uh, 
सी एन का थैंक यू ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू नीरेन फॉर अ वेरी नाइस केस एंड इट एक्चुअली शोज ऑफ द डेलेमा ऑफ अ ट्रीटिंग फिजिशियन how to fit in a diagnosis when you have some you know some piece of the puzzle with you but uh, rest of the pieces are not actually adding up and uh, i think uh, we are many a times handicapped by not able to do extensive investigations because of the cost and other considerations so at times uh, so what's your take uh, dr ravi shankar and i would like uh, alok is there or is he is left alok also to you know suggest what because he there you might be seeing uh, more cases of rcvs uh, and and the uh, primary angiitis so what's your take on this case well i think i think for the first thing i'll say is that the the cases that have been presented today have been absolutely excellent you know great work up for the vast majority i, I mean rcvs is a difficult uh, 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 question the, the you know cases uh, they tend to be you you can argue whether is that the primary process or is that an epi phenomena and and that's a dilemma which which you know we all face and i think you know the last case that was that was presented i think you know i think they've done very well to come to the conclusion uh, that this was uh, primary angiitis and i wouldn't be too worried about csf not showing abnormalities you know it doesn't take us away yeah i would uh, compliment you on the sequence uh, through which you have investigated because at first thought uh i would also have thought it is probable or cvs even though you got your angiogram normal but the fact that uh, there was no response to nimodipine and uh, you had to go along different directions with an anca also high levels and uh, this thing so i think the right way to go was to use steroids thinking that it's an angiitis and uh, like alok says you i don't know whether you did the search of literature on uh, what percentage of vasculitis have uh, csf normal because the response uh, to steroids and no response to nimodipine points uh, strikingly against any possibility of uh, atypical rcvs or probable rcvs also so i think it's a good worked up a very well worked up case and uh, we need to follow up now Yes, sir. Uh, about ten to twenty percent patients of uh, uh, CNS vasculitis may have normal CSF. So, considering those things, also yeah, uh, that's that's what Alok said. I mean, we will not be too much concerned about that. But it's only yeah. the temporal way the case has uh, progressed and the way you actually. Of course, uh, one could argue that uh, you know the catheter angiography was not done because uh, you know, uh, but then you did uh, what is that is best possible. and uh, of course there are reports also that rcvs may be picked up on the second angio when you do about a few weeks later the initial angio may be negative so those smaller uh, things might uh, be there but otherwise i think the cases were pretty well worked up and uh, they did show uh, i mean i think the most important thing is that in the routine clinical practice the way we see the edec patients and the associated neurological diagnosis and i think alok you will agree that this is a difference from west than than our country that where all the neurologists are seeing lot of headache cases with lot of secondary causes and whereas in most of the european centers and the us the headache specialists are primarily seeing the primary headaches and they are filtered out at the at the general level gp level or the secondary level so i think that gives a different perspective to us and and uh, and therefore we tend to uh, you know kind of see it from a, a slightly different perspective and work them up so uh, that's my take actually yeah. and and you're absolutely right and bear in mind that when you're looking at primary headache disorders you only definitively make a diagnosis of a primary headache syndrome once you've excluded a secondary cause so i think it's hugely important to do that and you know all the cases that were presented today you know they were worked up in excellent manner um, you know they were brilliant right thank you so any anybody else has any comments to make otherwise we any have extended the time comment? i think otherwise, two and a half hours vote of thanks and then uh, we wind up so any comments from anybody can all the panelists come on the screen so it's a pleasant task to give a vote of thanks and uh, alok wonderful lecture we enjoyed it thank you so much for updating us and all of you uh young neurologists who have presented such uh, interesting cases very well worked up you kept us all uh, very interested and uh, on our toes and all this 
has happened uh, primarily because of the efforts of Dr. Devashish. Uh -huh. So we need to thank him for putting everything together in such a sequence that everything has flown very well. So thank you, Devashish. It has been a wonderful thing. And uh, ultimately to the IAN, to all the, uh, to Dr. Pramod Pal, Dr. Gagandeep, to the members of the EC, we are very thankful for allowing us to conduct this uh, webinar and uh, it has been a good program. That's what I felt and I'm sure. No, just to add, sir, just to add, sir, I just received a phone call from Dr. SM Katrak and uh, he said that this is one of the best, wonderful programs uh, he has attended. He just left a few minutes back and he said, well done. So I think uh, you should take, he, Dr. Katrak is one of the doyens of neurology in India. And uh, when he has liked the program, I think overall, I would consider that our program has been successful. And we have got about more than 100 attendants, uh, attendees of the program. So in this Corona time, I would request everybody to stay safe and take adequate precautions. Don't lower your guards and uh, keep on working uh, for the betterment of uh, neurology as, as well as the headache medicine. Because headache medicine is very interesting. It, it shows up a lot of features in neurology rather than just the headache. So, so I think as a neurologist, everybody should be interested in headache medicine. Uh, so with that, I conclude uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.